Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and today, uh, yes, I'm treading into the territory of talking about Michael Jackson. Did he mess with little boys or didn't he? Mm -hmm. And this is a, kind of a dangerous territory to go into because he is such a beloved uh, icon that people can't stand maybe to hear anything even the slightest bit negative. I saw some interesting comments on other uh, on other YouTube channels where basically he was called literal well I will say they actually wrote he is like he is Jesus Christ not like but is uh, and that his pureness of heart absolutely the most pure person to ever walk the face of the earth and I'm like okay you know he was human <laughs> you know he he's not God he's not the son of God he's he's a human being like the rest of us who has a very interesting life and um so i want to bring a bit of reality um and this has nothing to do with his talent at all i mean he is amazing one of the uh, incredible musician incredible singer incredible dancer incredible songwriter incredible entertainer awesome and but what i'm going to talk about is the human part of him and his life and whether he was being um unfairly uh, accused of things uh, and if he was why did this kind of thing happen and if he wasn't how did this happen so I'm going to talk about all of that and take take a very broad view of of all the issues involved um, and before I start I do want to ask if everybody can see and hear me because yes I was I'm having <laughs> mic problems today so um, can you see, hear me clearly because my microphone seemed to have one one week it was like so loud everybody was asking me to stop screaming and then all of a sudden I sound like a mouse so I I think I have to replace my microphone that's uh, something wrong with it so I will do that but it's here today so I want to make sure you can hear me so what are you saying guys oh loud and clear oh thank you Joe Whew, okay that's a relief okay <laughs> no hum either hmm, that's good all right ah, maybe things aren't going to be as bad as I thought they were it's a you know, Memorial Day weekend. I just got back from a, a birthday party at the pool and and everything was doing that usual technical disasters. Anyway, let me see who's here in the chat room before I start. Um, I, I know that uh, Aunt Molly wanted to be here, but she's probably got maybe fun things to do. So she said she's going to not be here. Um, uh, Ann Liebman is here. Uh, glad to have you here. Joe is here. Uh, let's see who is it. Lisa S is here. Martin's here. And Lisa N is here. That's fantastic. And it's for Lisa. She's in New Zealand, right? So Monday morning for you instead of Sunday. And it's probably not Memorial Day in uh, New Zealand either. So, uh, <laughs> um, and Carrie's here. And I'm trying to get through my list here. <laughs> and let's see. Okay. Gretchen's here. Um, I might, if I miss you, Carol, Carolyn is here. Yay. All right. And maybe somebody else who I've missed. And I, if I missed you, I'm sorry. And I'm sure if you come in later, I might not see you right when you come in. Anyway, if you would like to be in this chat room, folks, um, and you wonder why you're, why it says live and you're not here, it's because uh, the live, the live portion is for Patreon uh, supporters. Um, and over here you can become a member just go below you can click on the link become a member of patreon uh and join in any of my lives uh all of my lives um are great now because i have a wonderful community really nice people and not a lot of you know un unusual folk coming in and causing trouble which is what happens when it's open to the public but all my videos are available to you whether you join Patreon or not, you can see every one of my uh, videos. And uh, if, if you just like to subscribe to the channel, please do that. Like this video. Click the bell so you can be um, given some information on what's coming up. And also check the playlist. People keep forgetting to do this. You can go through my playlist and see every one of the cases that I've talked about. And there's a lot of them now because I've been here a while. And also you can support the channel by buying a book or clicking on the dollar sign below and giving a one-time donation. That helps me keep afloat. All right, so now <clears throat> to Michael Jackson. All right, uh, this is, it was really fascinating, this whole, I took a whole kind of a, okay, hold on, how to, already, huh? okay, let me get, let me get comfy here. <clears throat> okay, now, <laughs> Michael Jackson, uh, I, I 
want to let you know what I looked at. Oh, Doreen's here. Hi, Doreen. All right. Um, let me tell you what I looked at to do some of my analysis. Um, first of all, I want to mention that, let me, let me find it here. Hold on a sec. Cause I got a bunch of stuff up here. Okay. Um, I know a lot of you like Dr. Grande. Um, he did this one about was Michael Jackson guilty? And I recommend, I'm, I'm linking it below. Uh, I recommend listening to him. I think he's given a very balanced viewpoint. And I know he probably was very careful not to upset anybody. He did a very, very, but a very good, you know, here's the reasons why this, he might, things point to guilt. And this is why things point to innocent. And he, he uh, saw the um, show, it's called uh, Leaving Neverland. Um, Leaving Neverland. It's a four hour production. And he says, <laughs> which I found rather amusing. He said, it was very boring and I don't like boring things. And um, he was correct. Um, I didn't make it through the four hours. I, I didn't, I made it through two. Uh, and it was ex kind of excruciating. However, I did get to see these two guys do a lot of talking. Um, these are the guys that made, the later guys that made accusations ab uh, ab about what had happened in his home. Um, and so I got to hear their stories, and I say stories because there's some evidence that not all of their stories are accurate or truthful. And their families also talked, their mothers talked, um, a sister or brother. And so they all gave this input during this first two hours of the show as to what, what happened with their family and with, um, with Michael Jackson and with their claims of sexual abuse by Michael Jackson when they were just, I think, between five and nine years old in that range. Um, it was very, very slow. It really, really was. And, um, but I did find some value in what they were saying as to the whole concept of people who get involved with celebrities. And I think this is very, very important. And I'm going to explain why this is important from both the shall we say, victims, I'm putting quotes around that because we don't know that they were victims of, uh, there's not proof that they were victims of sexual abuse, but, but could be victims of dealing with celebrity. And also on the side of Michael Jackson, you know, was he a perpetrator of not necessarily sexual abuse, but of abusing his celebrity for his own particular needs. And that is, that came out very clearly in this um, first part. Uh, so I, I did appreciate seeing it. Um, I also saw this, um, this is Leaving Neverland, the aftermath, and they, this basically is a, they just trash a living heck out of the show and say, this is, this is what was wrong, this is what, this wasn't true, this wasn't true, this wasn't true, and basically try to get you to, you know, not believe anything that was in the show. Um, I found it, some of it I found nitpicky. Some of it I found interesting, as maybe there's good reason that that, that person is one of these is not telling the truth. Um, they also it, I it linked uh, somewhere to a um, lawsuit, and so I looked at the lawsuit against HBO who made the show, and interesting enough, in the lawsuit against HBO, it really wasn't much about anybody lying as much as it was about they had the right to have certain to use certain things or have certain people in there. So it was kind of interesting that they didn't go full blast on um, uh, basically slander and libel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so then there's one more thing I want to point out that I looked at, which was uh, this is a show, um, and it was called Living with Michael Jackson. And this, this was huge. Uh, Martin Bashir was the host of this show, the journalist, and he got Michael Jackson to sit down with him and tell him a whole bunch of stuff. And after that happened, people got really, really upset about it. And, and so then this other one was done. Um, I think, it, who, who was, I forgot who was hosting this one. This is, uh, I think it was a Maury Povich. Um, and he said, so this came out called How Martin Bashir Manipulated uh, Michael Jackson. And it was basically a takedown of the other one. So you see this is battleground going on. And I watched that one, I'm like, I, would, I thought it was a very unconvincing thing at all. I didn't find that Martin Bashir so much trashed um, Michael Jackson or manipulated him into saying things he shouldn't say. I found him to be the usual journalist kind of guy um, <laughs> who will say nice things to you to get you to talk, 
and you know, and this is what they pointed out during the, the, that particular uh, show was that when Martin Brashear was doing his documentary on him, Michael Jackson actually required that he had his own camera in there with them, and I thought that was kind of brilliant. Um, I like that because I, you know, I've been, I've been, I, <laughs> I have had um, my stuff edited and stuff put in there I didn't even say the way they put it in there, and I would like to have proof, but you know, I, I didn't have the power to get that done. He did, and they never said that anything was manipulated as far as what uh, Michael Jackson said. What they said was Martin Bashir like buttered him up, you know, like, I think you're the greatest guy in the world. I think you're a wonderful father. And then later in the show, he goes, his fathering kind of concerns me. So they're like, see, he, he didn't say that to Michael Jackson. He said it later. And that's what they do, producers. I don't like it, but they do it. Done it to me. Oh, Pat, we think you're the best profiler ever. And then when the show comes out, they trash me. And I'm like, gee, thanks, you know. So I don't necessarily agree with the way it was done, but the things that Michael Jackson said weren't necessarily not manipulated. He said what he said, and I'm going to get into the, some of the things he said which do show his character and show some insight into who he is, and um, it's rather fascinating. So anyway, those are, those are the things I looked at. Oh, sorry. Um, so now let's get to Michael Jackson. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> really, this is interesting. Mar Gretchen says Martin Bashir also got in trouble for his Princess Diana interview. Well, you know, he's slick. You know, he is slick. Um, but I don't know that what I saw him, what I saw in the Michael Jackson interview, I didn't really see that it was highly manipulated. I didn't. I, I think he put him on the spot and, and Michael Jackson answered and maybe didn't like that he answered it or had to answer it. And maybe in between, I say Martin Bashir just was being his best buddy so that he'd open up. And they do that, you know? It's like, oh, just so, you know, you're wonderful, you know, and they just hang with you till you, you give up stuff that you probably sh maybe shouldn't have said. <laughs> so, interesting. But anyway, let's look at what happened in his life that became this huge problem. Um, all right, let me, let me go to my Wikipedia page. Just, just the basics uh, so you can understand the, the whole setup for this, how he eventually got accused of something and how he, you know, he never was proven to be true uh, in a court of law, and, uh, but it kind of lingers, shall we say. So Michael Jackson in the middle here, and that's the uh, Jackson 5 when they were the Jackson 5. Now, uh, if anybody doesn't know, <laughs> he was born in 2009. Um, he was dubbed the King of Pop, and he, even as a small child, he was just the best. He was the best. His, everybody in the family could sing. You know, we know Jack, Janet Jackson's his sister. She's great, too. And the brothers were good. He just, for whatever reasons, Michael just was the greatest. Uh, he, had, he had everything as far as star potential. Now, apparently, uh, with some of the issues in this whole case is that he had a somewhat abnormal childhood, okay? And, and when we say an abnormal childhood, it's like saying the Williams sisters, the tennis players, um, had an abnormal childhood. Well, they did. They had a very forceful father who wanted them to become tennis champions, and that's what he made them, tennis champions. I mean, they didn't do the things that normal kids do, like you know, <laughs> hang out with their friends and, you know, go to you know, just, just do basic stuff and play Monopoly games. They were too busy playing tennis, like a lot. And he, his father, Joe, wanted this to be a, his singing family. So he made them sing and perform. And that was it. It was pushed and pushed and pushed. And you'll see the same thing is true with kids who are, uh, oh, I don't know, spelling, spelling bee contests, peak kids, um, you know, any kid that's being pushed at a young age to be a pianist, to be a violinist or whatever, their childhoods are not normal. And the question is, what is normal in a sense of, is it better or is it worse? Just because you didn't get a chance to, you know, hang out and do stupid stuff did not, and, and have a, a paper route instead of singing and, <laughs> you know, spend more time with your gerbil doesn't necessarily mean that your life was worse or better. I mean, it's just kind of, people can live very normal lives and have crappy childhoods. 
you know, they can. They can have boring childhoods. They can have poor childhoods. They can have childhoods where they're, they're beaten, where they're, their parents are drug users. Um, they don't, you know, whatever. They can have crappy childhoods without becoming famous, you know. Uh, so they're just, they're, people just have different childhoods. So there's a lot said that because he had this, quote, abnormal childhood, he didn't get to play like other children got to play and have the freedom. And his father was very domineering um, that... That's why he is where he is today. No, I don't know that that's true. He could have, you know, he could have had some of his own internal problems and just be the way he is. Um, so there's a whole big thing here, for example, that his father, the reason he had to, supposedly the theory that he's had a lot of nose surgeries to get thinner and thinner nose is that his father called him, like, made fun of his nose. Well, I'm looking at the rest of the family, and their noses aren't small either. So <laughs> I'm not sure why he particularly should be nailed for his nose, because they all have big noses. I mean, if you're, looking, if you're talking about noses being wide, I guess they all basically all do. My ex-husband had a very wide nose. I mean, I like wide noses. That's, I think they're attractive. You know, so why that would be a big issue, or whether that was blown up to be a big issue, I really don't know. Um, so the concept is, is that he grew up never having a childhood, and that's why he wanted to be Peter Pan. He said, in my heart, I'm Peter Pan. Even though I'm a, an adult man, I'm Peter Pan. Now, so in other words, in the concept of an arrested childhood, uh, that he never grew up, that's why he always wanted to spend time with little boys, young boys, um, because he wanted to just hang out with young boys. Well, you know, growing up, he had a lot of kids to hang out with in his family. They were all boys, you know. Um, is that really the reason? Um, and, you know, regardless of what everybody says, when he was a, an adult, guess what? He is an adult, okay? He was an adult. He grew up. He became an adult. So to say that, you know, he's a, a forever child is ridiculous. That's an adult, that's an adult. Um, now, sometimes there's certain people who have, they get to a certain age and they kind of like linger in that age. I would say yes, he has kind of a be some thinking. I would, I would put him more like 13, you know, like a young teen who just never quite, he wanted to be a young teen forever, um, never, whatever, you know, kind of that could be in his brain. But that's a lot of people have that. Uh, and let me point out the concept of narcissism. Narcissism is a big issue in the fact that when one becomes very narcissistic, that is a trait of a person who has not fully become an adult in the sense that I'm going to res accept responsibility for who I am and accept the responsibility of having to um, also be fair to other people in equal relationship. Teens, young teens, it's all about them, isn't it? It's all about them. So a lot of narcissists, that's kind of the way they are. They're like this teen who still thinks he should be able to do anything he wants and everything should be about him, and that, that's, that's what narcissism is. And I believe that Michael Jackson suffered from a very severe narcissistic personality disorder, and I think that's where the confusion comes in. When people say he's pure of heart and all of, of this, I don't think that's quite accurate. I think he has... He had a very, very, when he looked in the mirror, as he said, the man in the mirror, I think he saw himself, and that was what he was about, himself, and all of his needs, what he needed. It looked like he gave to the world, and, you know, when you become very rich and famous, you can give, but you're giving to get. So that gets very confusing to people as to how pure is that, or is it, you know, all of us don't mind giving if we can get something. That's not necessarily narcissistic, but... It can become that if your concern for the other person gets really low and your concern for yourself is really high and therefore you start using people to a degree where you aren't really concerned about their health and well-being. So that to me is a big part of this whole picture. Um, let me just stop here for just a second to see um, if anybody has anything to say here. Oh, yes, this is, yeah, sounds like Joe Jackson was the ultimate tiger parent. Yeah, and he might, I, I believe he probably also had his own, like, possible personality disorder where he, he wanted, he was living vicariously through his children and wanted them to be. He wanted to make them famous because that made him what, who he was. He was always struggling to be somebody. And his children made him that somebody. Now, admittedly, he was also very good as a, as a manager. I mean, he had his own 
you know, qualifications. And, um, but, you know, he was, according to the family, a bit of a, a tyrant in that sense. And, um, but he points out, hey, you know, from where we lived before, if I hadn't pushed the kids, they'd probably be on the street doing drugs, selling drugs. And he's got a point there, you know? So it's like, are you doing a good thing for your kids or a bad thing for your kids? And in the long run, do they turn out happier or not so happy? And again, I don't think you can absolutely say because you could not do any of the things Joe did. They could have lived in the neighborhood and he could have been a milkman and half the kids could turn out to be a mess. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I don't think that just because you made this choice uh, because you had talented children that you've done a terrible thing. However, I will point this out. Hollywood and music industry are very, very um, hard, hard places to be as far as your struggles to be in those venues, to the, the, the amount of time you have to spend on the road, the amount of pressure you have on you, uh, the, and the quote, not so normal thing where, you know, you're not going to school on a regular basis, you're homeschooled or whatever. You know, although I homeschooled all three of my kids and so, you know, and they weren't in the music business. So there, there are, it is a very, very unique place to be, to just be, to be fair about that. Um, very unique fa uh, place. So, and it also has an effect on the people that are brought in. And this is where the victimology comes in. So anyway, let's see what happened to Michael along the way here. All right. Now. The problem Michael had was not that he built Neverland. Neverland was a cool, well, that was a darn cool place, you know. <laughs> I don't think I mind living there either. Um, I mean, it was an incredibly beautiful home. Um, he had, uh, and yeah, so this is his Neverland. I mean, he had, you know, the guy was rich as crap, so he bought, made this beautiful place. And he, he did want to have this childlike um, Peter Pan land um, where all the fun things were so he had the amusement park there and it and he had incredibly beautiful grounds uh, grounds there um, let's see if I have my picture here yeah there it is let me say it's in a beautiful area and hey there's a llama there eh, we have llamas too so but you know I appreciate it. he had llamas he had chimps he had elephants you know um, had a zoo uh, and for himself I can see where he has the right to have any kind of beauty he wants around him in any kind of way, any kind of little fantasy he wants to live in. When he, especially when he's not working, he wants to go someplace he enjoys. Um, and then he brought children there. Okay? He brought children into that location. Um, and is that wrong to bring children there and give them a happy day? Well, the answer to that is, of course not. I mean, why shouldn't he be able to bring children there and, and have a, have a, have a, where's my, where's my little picture going to? Okay, um, dang it, things disappear on me again. Um, uh, so he, you know, he brings kids there and, and it's, it's happiness. It's happiness for the children. And, you know, what's, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. So I want to get people to understand where I'm saying there's an issue and where I'm saying there's not an issue, okay? So he wanted to bring children there to have a great time um, so they could uh, just, you know, especially if they're poor or they were sick, um, you bring a whole bunch of kids there. And this is, this is a big important thing. A whole bunch of kids is one thing. One kid is another thing, okay? So a whole bunch of kids means that you're giving to the community and you're spending time with a whole bunch of kids so that you therefore um, have eyes on you that show that you are not singling any child out, spending excess amount of time with one child, and that starts becoming weird, okay? Um, and, and a lot of people say, well, you know, he's a celebrity, so, you know, he's a little different and blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you something. Uh, when you're a celebrity, it is your responsibility, your responsibility, and he was an adult, not a child. And he has a mega, mega amount of lawyers, <laughs> you know, lots of lawyers, um, who to tell him, this is appropriate behavior, this is not appropriate behavior. This is appropriate, this is not appropriate. And let me give you an example of some of what I call appropriate and not appropriate. Oh yeah, here, here's the picture I was looking for. There he is, you know, happy with the children, running, having a great time. There's no problem with this. 
He's giving to the children a happy time. And of course, it's, a, it's you know, it's also publicity. You know, it's always a mix, you know, you're famous. Um, so yeah, you know, that's fine. All right, now let's look at something else that's not, that's okay. Um, what is that picture? Uh, sometimes it's hard to see my pictures. That's, that's why I always point out, it's like, what the heck is that picture? Oh, oh, here's another thing that's okay. This is one of the, and let me, uh, there's, let me see if I can find their names. I, I misplaced their names in here somewhere. Um, there's two, two boys that, one is Wade Robson and the other one was, hold on a second. I just lost his name now. Um, this is somebody, this is not the first accusation he had. I'm going to bring up that point in a minute, but this is one of the children that he had the close relationship with. Now, there they are on stage. The kid's a great dancer. He got an opportunity to be on stage with Michael Jackson, and he's welcoming a child onto the stage to dance with him. Again, nothing wrong with that. It's fun. And the kids are having a good time, and it's public. All right? Public. Now, things can get weird, and just because you're Michael Jackson doesn't mean that this is something that you should do. Okay. And I'm going to give you an explanation about his behaviors in comparison to another very famous person um, who did think, has done things differently, although has much similarity. And this is one of my favorite actors in the whole world, um, this guy here, Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh Khan, I am a big, huge fan of. Um, he is probably the third richest actor in the world, um, one of the most famous, and if you're an American, you probably have no clue who he is, although he's like massive famous across the rest of the world. I mean, I think he has like $800 million or something like that. He's rich. He's very rich. Um, and he's done like over 50 movies. He's, he's the king of Bollywood. And that's those, that's the uh, Indian music industry. Uh, so he's called the king of Bollywood. He's called King Khan. Um, people, SRK. People absolutely go crazy about him. He's super popular in Germany. If he gets off a plane in Germany, they absolutely go berserk on him. And Here's a picture of him. Now, by the way, this is his wife, and this is one of his sons. That's his daughter, and that's his other son. So he's got three kids, and um, here he is outside. He has a, a house uh, in Mumbai, which is like many stories high, and he's out on one of his balconies. I think so this was his birthday, so people wanted to give him greetings. Okay, this is a popular dude, okay? That's the people outside that he's waving to, okay? So like Michael Jackson, v massive massive fans massive everywhere he goes just the same with michael jackson people are trying to crush the car and any place he goes there's people all over him so let's look at some of the things we see differently that that michael jackson got in trouble for and and shower Khan did not here is michael jackson dangling a baby over a balcony with a with a patel on its head Okay, a baby kind of looks like a baby, folks. I mean, I don't know that it's a big deal that the, there was a picture of this baby's face. That is a peculiarity of Michael Jackson, which I think is part of his own, his, his own psychological issues. Now, also, that's inappropriate, and, and it upset many people. He didn't seem to understand that. Here's Shah Rukh Khan showing his son without a towel on his head, standing up there, and they're waving, they're waving at people, and she's showing his son as well. Nobody had a problem with this. People had a massive problem with that. Now, let's look at some other, let's look at one other thing, um, which is where I think he gets himself in trouble. Okay. Um, let me find it. Okay. Uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Oh, hold on a second. Oh, here. Ah, okay. Hold on a second. I might have lost it again. Okay. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? All right. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, here is... Michael Jackson was one of the kids that eventually accused him of sexual harassment. See how he's got his arm around his neck. See how he's got his arm around his body. See how they're cuddling. This is, is something you would expect that they, they were like maybe father and son, but they're not father and son. They're father and somebody else's son. I mean, I'm sorry, they're Michael and somebody else's son. And it's a very kind of almost romantic appearance I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it has that appearance of too close a relationship for a man of his age and a child that is not his own. Now, here, here is Shah Rukh Khan with a child. He's, he's holding him and he's kissing him. But that's his son. <laughs> that's his son. That's called normal. Normal. And then when you're with children and you're famous, 
you want to be in a room full. Here is Shah Rukh Khan with the children and, and tons of kids around him. They adore him. They think he's the best thing ever. Here he is dancing with them. Oh, he's all happy, happy. Here he is giving them presents. Okay, see, he, it's perfectly fine. He, these, are, these, are, these are good things. He's in a large group of children and in front of other people. These are not children that are in his home, in his private space. The children in his private space is that. His, his, his three children and his wife are in his private space. And if he has children over, guess who they come to see? His other children. They're not there to see him. They're to, there to see his children so they can play and have a normal life, um, even though they're massively famous. So when you, when you instead of just, you know, in showing your adoration to your own children, you show adoration to not just children in general, but a particular group of children in your home, then we start getting into a problem because that is not appropriate. And any, I think we all know, even, even, um, even, even when you're just a quote normal person, if you're a soccer, if you're a soccer coach, you don't invite one of the boys from the soccer team into your home without that child playing with your other son, you know, with your son. If you have, if your son's on the soccer team and their kids are coming to play with him, that's fine. You don't invite him into your home Let's say you don't have any kids. You don't invite soccer kids into your home and have them lie around and stay overnight with you. You don't do it because you're an idiot if you do, because it, it doesn't come off right. What you do is you do a picnic with the entire soccer team. You hang out with the entire soccer team. You don't go places alone with those children. So that was the problem we have with Michael Jackson. And here he is with one of the families um, and the child in the hat is the one that eventually spent more time with him. And there's arguments about how much time he spent with him. And if you watch the, uh, uh, the Neverland movie, you'll see that they're saying they spent a lot of time together. And then you see the anti, uh, living Neverland movie. And they said, Oh, that's highly exaggerated. Okay. But, but I want to point out something about this concept with the family and the child. And here is, again, some of the problems um, that I have with his behaviors. Okay, so now I'm having, see, see, I'm having fuzzy problems today. I can't seem to fix what's going on in my computer today. It's driving me nuts. Let's see if I can fix it. Okay, hold on a second. Wait, watch it. Oh, did I fix it? Oh, maybe I fixed it. Yeah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. Um, there is a, an appropriate distance you have uh, uh, as a celebrity to non-celebrities an appropriate distance. All right, let me, I want to explain how that all works uh, just so I can back up a little bit um, and help people understand the, what happens in an industry like Hollywood and, and, and the music industry and television industry. Um, so before I go, I'll check out any, see if I have any comments here that I want to comment on. Okay, let me go here now to the problem with Hollywood and the music industry and all that. Uh, so, um, one thing I can tell you is that I have familiarity with Hollywood, I have familiarity with the TV industry, not the music industry, I never was in that, um, but I just have enough, okay, I never was, um, <laughs> I spent a year in Hollywood, um, trying to become a, a model actress, and I, I wouldn't go for the casting couch, so that was the end of that, um, but I did spend time there to see what was going on, and I've been in the television industry for over 20 years, so, um, been around the block on that. So I have a familiarity with what happens behind the scenes, not what you're sitting there and seeing on your television set, which is something distant, but what happens behind the scenes. Um, and one of my, the things I, I remember most was this particular incident. And this is, this is when I was on the Montel show. Um, and I was talking about a Madeline McCann, which is one of the rare times I ever got to talk about Madeline McCann because normally they won't let me on. So, um, so what happened in the green room was what really threw me. So normally you go to the green room and the green, green room is where you are before the show. And what you're doing there is you're just waiting basically. And sometimes they got snacks, you know, little things you can eat and drinks. And they come in and say, do you need anything? And they're very nice to you. And they put you in the green room. Then you get called to go to makeup. You get to sit there and you get your hair done like this and you get your makeup done and 
No. And then they bring you back to the green room. And then when they're ready to have you on the show, they show up and they go, okay, it's time to go on the show. And then come on and, you know, onto the show. So you walk onto the show. And, oh my God, it's Montel Williams, you know? And you're going to sit there and talk to Montel Williams. Now, I was part of the television world at this time. I've been on television over the years, over 3,000 times. So <laughs> I've been on a lot of major shows over and over and over again. And sometimes, you know, it's just, it's like, okay, you just, you just do it. You're not, you're not overly excited anymore because you've done that before. Um, and sometimes there's people even say, uh, you know, hey, I think that guy showed up on the, the Tonight Show and he kind of seemed drunk. And I'm thinking he probably was because to him, the Tonight Show was like his living room. <laughs> you know, He's, He probably didn't give a crap. You know, He's done so many shows. But in the green room at this particular time with Montel, I remember this because, um, no, this wasn't this time. I'm sorry. No, it wasn't the Madeline McCann case. It was another, another show with Montel where he was interviewing the parents of murdered children. Um, and I was in the green room with one of the, fa the parent of a murdered child. And, you know, they came to talk about, like, the worst thing that had ever happened to them, the thing that has destroyed their lives and torn them apart. But when they were in the green room, they were so excited I mean, super excited. And they got, when they went to get their hair and makeup done, they were super excited. They were beside themselves with absolute, they were just thrilled beyond belief. I mean, their kid was dead, but hey, they were gonna be on Montel Williams, me on Montel Williams. And I remember thinking, really? I mean, the kid's dead, been brutally murdered, and you're really excited about being on Montel Williams. But here's the thing. This is a world that almost nobody sees in a nor when we call, we talk about normal life, right? In normal life, most people don't get to be on television. They don't get to be on the stage of a you know. Uh, they're not a they're not a famous star, a music star. They may be in the audience watching. They're not on stage. Um, they may be watching television. They're not on television unless they decide to do a reality show and say that their boyfriend had sex with their mother and their grandmother and their child. You know, then they, get, <laughs> they might get on. But most people never, ever have those opportunities. And so what happens is this. If you're a person who gets to go, go on Montel one time, uh, let's say it's not even an unpleasant circumstance. You're going to talk about education or something, let's say, <laughs> or, or maybe a skin disease you have. Uh, so you go on Montel and you have this one moment of thrill. You, they, you, they fly you to New York, the limo picks you up, you're all like, ee, ee, and they drop you off at the studio, and everybody's like, hey, hey, and they're so nice to you. you know? And then you get this done, and then you have whatever, and then they take you, put you in the limo, and get you to the airport, and get you out of there. And so this is a moment that's extremely thrilling, okay? One moment that's thrilling. But now I want to talk to you about what happens when we're not talking about just a one-time thrill, when we're talking about this. All right, there is a great difference between working in pictures and working in music and working with the different people in music. And it's another thing when you start bringing somebody in and, and giving them special treatment and the special treatment doesn't stay in the studio it go, goes elsewhere. It goes to your home. It goes goes to getting on your your plane and flying with you. It gets to going being part of your entourage and all of that. And then when you bring the families along, this is this is key to some of the issues here. Um, we talk about grooming, and there's there is we grooming in a sense is that we we talk about it usually in sen sense of uh, uh, somebody who's like. A, a pedophile especially they where they groom the child they get the child to get comfortable with them and want to be with them um, and and then that child becomes they, they they bring them into their inner circle and make become f best friends and then when the when the sexual abuse happens that best friend doesn't want to rat you out and they might even enjoy some of that sexual stuff so they're like oh my god I'm so special you know special and this, we're talking here about you know, some guy down the block. I'm not even talking about a celebrity. But when a celebrity starts to single out people, now they're going to, they're choosing, in Michael Jackson's case, one of the creepy things about it is that, and I'm going to say creepy because it does come across that way, is he seemed to single out certain boys to be with him. 
Um, and then he brought them into his world. And a lot of times he brought their families to some extent to get the families to trust him and to leave the child with them. And the child then thinks if mom and dad are okay with this, then must be okay, period. So you, and it's also called luring. You lure people in. And, and, and a celebrity knows darn well that what they have to offer is a thousand times more exciting than what is offered back home. And this is where the imbalance of power comes in. So for example, a guy is a pilot for uh, American Airlines and he wears a really nice looking suit. Um, I mean, his, his uniform. And women just love those freaking uniforms and they like pilots. Why? Because it's an exciting life. So if they are a person who hasn't traveled much, and they meet this guy and they find out, oh my God, you're a pilot <gasps> for the airlines. Immediately, the power imbalance goes like this. Now, there are always power imbalances in life. You know, powerful people have more luck than not so powerful people. That, that is life, you know, folks. Let's be realistic. You know, so a guy with more money has a better chance with women than a guy with no money, right? That's, you know, you can get a little short, bald dude with a million dollars, he'd get a girlfriend. You know, <laughs> you get a little short, bald dude who makes 25000 a year. That dude's sitting at the end of the bar, you know, wondering why I can't get a date, right? <laughs> That's the way the world works. And it's always going to be some imbalance somewhere, okay? Forever in history. However, when you get to the level of a Michael Jackson imbalance, this is the guy that is at the top of everything with the with everything. I mean, he's so freaking famous and he's got Neverland and he's got massive money and he's got so much fame it's just outrageous and so when that person then focuses in on a regular family not a person who's already in the industry at a high level um not a person who's already an accomplished person or has people who are already wealthy as heck but you actually look at a middle class family there's in a regular house dad has a regular job mom is kind of like you know maybe she wants her son to be famous you know uh, the stage mother type, hoping he's going to make it, you know. And then here comes Michael Jackson and pays attention to that child and that family. It's a massive imbalance. And what it turns out to be, and I, they pointed this out, I think, in, in Leaving Neverland, and I liked it, intoxicating. It's intoxicating. In other words, it's like heroin, like absolute heroin. You get a hit of that, and you never want to go back. You, you, you want the hit over and over and over again because it's not one time and you may you know you know you're never going to get it again he brings you in and yeah you start traveling you're on the plane you're going to the studio you're on you know you're going to his home to neverland and not with all the rest of the people just you and your family and you're getting invited that is like crack you want it you know it's so amazing no you don't want to give it up and so if you give that person that kind of attention that level one time they're hooked and they want it again and again and anybody who's in a place of power knows this so that's how come the casting couch is so successful all right so we had the old me too movement in hollywood because how many women mostly women succumbed to the casting couch they did i didn't when i was there and i didn't get any work either <laughs> stupid me um but a lot, it's very popular there because you know if you can get the guys know hey they want to get in my movie they'll sleep with me and guess what they will because it's their chance for this big time they've seen the big time it's right there they could just reach out and get it but they have to sleep with somebody okay whatever that'll be over in an hour and maybe I'll have the prize well once you introduce the prize to the person and actually bring them into it where they're that's your they, you bring them into the world once they're there, they're not going to want to walk away from it and go back to the little neighborhood, the little house, going to work every day, watching TV in the, in the you know, television room. We used to call them that. Anyway, you know, in the, yeah, they don't, that, that, that's so bland. After, after all that, that's so bland. And so now the person never wants to give it up. And what will a person do for a fix? Just about anything so this is the imbalance that michael jackson put a number of children and families okay so whether he took advantage of that sexually or did not 
He knew he had it make it, he was making an imbalance. It was a terrible imbalance. He knew he was offering them a massive drug that they could not resist. And therefore he was getting what he wanted. And this is where I talk about narcissism. Um, and you can c convince yourself, you know, if you're Michael Jackson, maybe, oh, I'm just helping that kid. No, you're help, you, you help kids by, you know, giving a ton of money to a cancer organization by bringing poor children to Neverland for the day. You help people by doing a, a, a huge um, uh, college fund, you know, so that hundreds of children who are uh, uh, underprivileged can go to college when, if they, you, know, you, you support the orchestra, you support whatever you want to support. You do it in a group. You don't do it with one because when you're doing it with one, you're taking advantage of them for whatever reasons, okay? And you're going to basically say, if, if, if I don't, if, if anything, if I, when I get bored with you, I'll pull the rug out. I'll dump you. And if uh, you better, not, I better not get bored with you. I better not. And also, so, so look at this. When he had children in his presence and people keep saying, they keep talking about his bedroom. Um, oh, you know, it's just, um, let me, let me put him back. Let me get me, I've been on the screen behind myself too long here. Get married to me. Okay. Let me go back to the two guys who made the complaint. Um, I didn't mean to leave myself up there. Okay. So there, when you've got the, and when they, they were children, right? So at the time, let me just go put, I'll put the children. Okay. Here we go. All right. So here, here, here is one of the children. Okay. Now, when he chose to pick a child to spend special time with, whether it even is in the bedroom. Let's just say it's a special time on the property, on the plane, uh, wherever he's going. One child, not always with his family, not what, with his family always present, um, with a bunch of children always present. But when he starts focusing in on one child, he has some needs he's trying to meet. Whether they're sexual or not doesn't matter. Um, well, it matters legally, but he wants to have a personal relationship with a young child. Now, some people will say, oh, yeah, it's because he's, you know, you know, mentally arrested at the age of eight, and he just wants a little buddy. Okay. Too bad. Just too bad. It, it, isn't, it is not appropriate for you to make a buddy out of a little eight-year-old boy that isn't your own kid. You know, that's not appropriate. And if you're, 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 loving him, even if it's not sexual, you're just loving on him and giving him presents, not kid presents to a whole bunch of kids, him presents, give him presents, let him have everything he wants. Um, that's inappropriate uh, because now that child becomes enamored with you more so than even just as, as, as a celebrity. He becomes enamored with you as, as a person. And then they, they, you know, children fall in love in their own childlike way with a person like that. Now that should be their own family. This should be their daddy. Not, not some, not some celebrity dude. It should be dad. Dad should take that role. And, and if this guy, he's replacing dad or older brother or worse, it shouldn't be happening because that's not appropriate. And that is what he was doing. Now, let me, let me just go through the basics of what happened. Now the 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 uh, the accusations against him. Um, so the first one was um, let's pull it up here. Okay. All right. Okay. Hold on. First, okay. It was 1993 that he was first accused of sex, child sexual abuse by 13-year-old boy Jordan Chandler and his father Evan Chandler. Jordan said that he and Jackson had engaged in acts of kissing, masturbation, and oral sex. All right, so that was the claim, okay? Um, so then they did raid his home. The police raided his home, found two legal large format art books featuring young boys playing, running, and swinging in various states on dress, which is concerning. It's not illegal to have a boy, you know, pay, uh, uh, it's not illegal to have an album of boys, you know, in, in swimsuits. It's not creepy, but not illegal, you know. Um, and then supposedly um, Jackson denied knowing of the book's content and claimed if they were there someone had to send them to him and he did not open them okay here we here we go with and I'm gonna get into does does Michael Jackson always tell the truth and there's a big problem with this because when you lie about some things 
means you might lie about other things. And in my opinion, why would the book, why would the book be there um, at all? I mean, yes, people send him things, but you know, there's, there's, there's ways where when you are particularly famous like him, that you have a, you have somebody who monitors that and separate you from what what the crap is rolling in because you know, you're not talking about occasional you know occasionally you can have a you know a fan send you something or friends send you something that's fine when you get massive stuff coming in like him believe me you, you can send that to a warehouse you know what i mean it's not even it shouldn't even be in your house why the heck would it come to your house you know it shouldn't even be there because if you have a, if you have people handling these things why would it be there so i'm not i don't i have trouble with his explanation right there all right so at any rate, supposedly Jordan Chandler gave p police a description of his genitals and a strip search was made and jurors, jurors felt the description was not a match. I, don't, I, I did not see all this trial. I do not know what the jurors thought. I'm not sure how the... I don't, I'm curious what they showed in court. Kind of like, ooh. Okay. Um, in January of 1994, Jackson settled with the Chandlers out of court for a reported total sum of $23 million. The police never pressed criminal charges. Citing a lack of evidence without Jordan's testimony, the state closed its investigation in 1994. Now, now people will say that's a heck of a lot of money if you didn't do something wrong. Well, that's true. It is a lot of money, but then he, he was a lot of rich. <laughs> He's a lot of rich. And sometimes people, sometimes the lawyers just say, settle, get rid of this guy, you know. And you didn't act, you're not actually guilty. So it doesn't prove you're guilty. But it does prove one thing. And I thought, hold on a second. Oh my God. Sorry. <laughs> I just have some condition when I'm on air that my nose always itches. Oh, hold on. This was one of the best things Dr. Grande pointed out in his, his video. He said, even if he didn't do a thing in 1993, um, the question is, why then did he not stop his behavior? And that is huge. So in other words, you know, Okay, let's say you're just so naive, and, and, and even though, I'm, I, I got to say, his lawyers, his, whomever was around had to say, dude, don't bring kids into your house that are just regular kids. Don't bring in families. Do not do this. You're a celebrity. This is, looks bad, and it looks like you're trying to take advantage of them, and that, now you've been accused of this. Never do this again. But what happened? He did it again. This shows me something that's amiss. So... He has one of two problems. One possibility is that he is exactly what people, some have claimed he is, that he likes little boys and that he has sexually abused them. That's one possibility. Second possibility, he doesn't sexually abuse them, but he wants to have this kind of weird, close relationship with a younger person, a, a loving relationship with a younger person, inappropriate, but not illegal. Um, And there, 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 there's a lot of question about his sexuality. Is he homosexual, heterosexual, asexual? And there certainly seems to be some evidence that he really doesn't, the, the, the female thing doesn't really work for him all that well. Now, right after this happened, he, he married uh, uh, Lisa Marie Presley. Is that, have I got her name right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, I got that right, right? <laughs> Lisa, Lisa Marie Sorry, I'm not big on Hollywood uh, celebrity stuff, so I kind of actually don't know people's names so so well. I'm trying to find his um. Somebody just tell me. Somebody in the chat room tell me if I got her name right, <laughs> so I can be embarrassed. Oh my God, Lisa Marie, Lisa Marie, where is it? Uh, I'm trying to find his um. Uh, trying to find his when he married he married Lisa Marie. If I've got the right name here, Jesus. How can I not know uh, Elvis Presley's daughter's name, but I don't. Okay, so his second marriage, or I want the first marriage. Okay, so he married her. Okay, I married her. He married her. When did he do that? Okay, he proposed to Lisa Marie. Oh, I think I got that right. Okay, so 19, late 1993, he proposed to Lisa Marie Presley. Okay, over the phone, which is a really a crappy way to propose to somebody. <laughs> but he had just gotten off of this big disaster with that he was supposedly molesting little boys. So he goes and he marries Lisa Marie Presley. And they only lasted a year and a half. Um, and there's questions whether they ever actually consummated the marriage. Now, Lisa Marie says they did. And he was 
sort of, sort of normal. But a lot of people have questioned that. Uh, is that really true or was this a sham marriage? Um, be, and he's, he did have some obsessions with certain people like Britney Spears. Um, and you wonder, well, if he, was he sexually attracted to them? Well, the answer to that is not necessarily because there's a lot of people who are attracted to that person's ability and their fame and their amazingness at, at doing stuff. For example, take a, take a look at all the gay guys who love Barbara Streisand. <laughs> you know? They're not, they're not, they're not hankering after her sexually. They love by Barbara Streisand. It's a big thing, you know? So there's no reason why he can't have a, be excited about Britney Spears, not because he wants to have sex with her, but because of her aura, her ability, and that kind of, the thrill he gets out of people who have other, other people who have great uh, abilities uh, and great entertainers. So there's a whole world where, you know, within that world, you're excited by other people who are famous because, you know, they kind of play off of each other. But there's a question of whether he married Lisa Marie Presley because he actually had an interest in her romantically or sexually, or that was his cover for what had happened. He was trying to get his name back that, hey, I'm not a child molester of little boys. So see, I'm marrying a woman. That's a, what a lot of people thought. All right, so now, um, so t so here's the point that Dr. Grande made, and I thought it was great. Okay, you, you, whatever happened, whether you touched that child or you didn't touch that child sexually, it didn't look good, and you had to pay off tw more than $20 million, and it, re it really messed your name up. So at that point in time, you should do what Shah Rukh Khan does. Don't have children privately in your house, you know, have, just see them out there, have big groups. Don't, 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 but don't be playing this little, little, I want to play with little children game and we're going to sit around and, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to have playmates. You're too old to have playmates. You might want them, but if you're going to have playmates, have playmates that, you know, maybe that are within your own family, you know, of course he eventually did get three children and that's a whole nother kettle of worms. So anyway, um, so at any rate, he gets, after that first thing happened, that accusation, he gets, he gets accused again, all right? So I'm going to get to his uh, second marriage in a little bit later, but I want to look at this. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so let's see, where is this one? Okay, this is where he gets charged with the second child abuse uh, um, claims. Beginning in May 2002, a documentary film led by uh, uh, Martin Bashir followed Jackson for several months. The documentary came out in 2003, in February, it's called Living with Michael Jackson, it showed Jackson holding hands and discussing sleeping arrangements with a 12 year old boy. And yes, this is unfortunate and true. Okay, so it was this, it was this, where's the kid? Um, and it was, I found it very inappropriate. Uh, and, 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 and to show in the film, Come on, where'd it go? Hold on one second. I tell you, things have gone missing on me again. You know, every time you come here, I know I tell you, say the same thing. Things have gone missing, I can't find it. Um, where is that picture? I had a picture of that. Let me see, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, because I thought it was su super creepy. Um, I really did. And I thought it was, boy, is that inappropriate. Don't do that. You know, don't do that. Um, oh, come on, where are you? Why have you gone missing? It has gone missing. I can't find it. Darn it all. Okay, so I can't find it. Anyway, so what happened was he has this picture, and he's sitting there, and he's holding the hand. You can see it in the thing. And the boy has, like, got his head on Michael's shoulder. They're, like, cozy. And again, this is not his son. This is somebody else's son, a 12-year-old boy who's leaning on him and holding his hand. Uh, doesn't look good. Okay. So they discuss sleeping arrangements. He said, this is Michael Jackson, that he saw nothing wrong with having sleepovers with minors and sharing his bed and bedroom with various people, which aroused controversy. He insisted the sleepovers were not sexual and that his words have been misunderstood. Now, I want to point something out that is absolutely very true when you're visiting India. In India, a lot of times people do sit on the bed and have conversations. It's just really common. Um, 
and then sometimes you uh, actually everybody will just sit on the bed and eat dinner you know you have like 20 people on a bed eating dinner and i've done that um that the bed pick is kind of like a couch sometimes in certain places i can tell you what you don't have you don't have the clo the doors closed at night and have one adult and one child that isn't part of that family sleeping with the adult then people get a little bit squirmy okay so this is apparently so yes you can be on a bed and it can be not sexual a bed doesn't mean sexual you can have you know anybody can have sex anywhere right i mean they can um it can be on the floor it can be on the couch it can be in a boat you know it's anywhere so a bed doesn't require any people sleeping together to have sex i mean i had a family bed uh, with my children and uh, so my husband and i and both my uh, two of my kids and then the third one came along he was older because he was five when we he came to our family so he didn't by that time everybody was in their own bed we were sick of them uh, <laughs> we'd had enough of kick being kicked in the night but you know nothing was sexual was going on because our four and two year old were in the bed you know um so yes you can do that but at a certain age you don't have your teenage daughter sleeping in the bed with now as a as a woman yes i might sleep with my teenage daughter if we're on a vacation or something but it is inappropriate for my teenage daughter to have slept with her father in bed on a vacation. It's creepy. I would go, you know, what are you doing? So, you know, that would not be okay. And it didn't happen in my family. All right. So they were trying to get, then explain, everybody keeps talking about this is, this is the big defense. Oh, his, his bedroom was like a, a freaking house, you know, it was huge. And so he had this upper level bed and, was, and then the lower, and he would let the kids sleep in the bed up there. And then he would sleep on the floor on some sleeping bags with a bodyguard okay maybe if you have eight children over and and and, and a, not only your bodyguard but a couple of the adults to monitor so that no everybody sees that there's eight kids they're all having a slumber party and you're not sleeping with them that's fine you got one kid up there i don't give a crap about your bodyguard you can buy your bodyguard you know the bodyguard is meaningless to me so you have one kid in that room with you all night long and there's no parent there and there's no other kids there and there's no other there's no other people except the, your paid staff i would say you're in trouble and so this goes on martin bashir's thing and and he says oh yeah and, and he is sitting there this is say martin bashir didn't fake this this is this is this is michael douglas i mean sorry michael douglas, sorry michael douglas <laughs> michael jackson sitting there with a kid leaning on him like he's in love with him holding his hand it's creepy maybe nothing happened between them sexually it's still creepy all right so then they then all then they got they had problems so anyway 2003 santa barbara authorities charged jackson with seven counts of child molestation and two counts of intoxicating a minor with alcoholic drinks he denied the allegations and pleaded not guilty. It was a big fat trial um, and he was acquitted on all counts. Um, I have not seen the trial. I don't know why they acquitted him. I don't know what went on in the trial. The jury made their decision. All right. So that's what happened there. Then after his death, those two guys, you know, then, then they became the leaving Neverland thing rolled up after his death. And so now you got these two guys um, who once upon a time actually I think at the trial, they actually said he was innocent and he didn't do anything. He, they, they, these guys, when their kids said, oh, no, no. And when we were sleeping in, in his area and when we were hanging out with him privately, he never touched us. And then later on, they came out and said, yes, he did. Now, there's two possibilities. One is, at that time, they didn't want to lose the love of Michael Jackson, so they lied for him. Or they were embarrassed that sexual things had happened and they didn't want to admit it. I don't know. Or... They were telling the truth and now they see a whole pile of money and try, they're going after the money in his estate i do not know and i am not going to say whether th what happened happened because i'm just talking about michael michael jackson's responsibility he got he had it was ac accused he was accused he, he ended up paying off that person over 23 million dollars he went ahead and did some did it again with another kid martin bashir brought it to light he went to end up going to trial. His choices were not good. So the problem is why does he make choices that are so inappropriate? And a lot of the problem is because he can, because he is that famous, because he is that rich, because he can get what he wants. And I don't know if what he wanted was sex or what he wanted was 
companionship and this weird, bizarre way of his, but it was inappropriate and should never have happened. And you could, there's a lot of people that jump on the parents and go, well, what kind of parents were they? You know, I mean, they, 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 they let their kid do this stuff. Well, as I said, the parents were drugged too. And I, by drugged, I mean intoxicated by the, the simple fact that they too were going to be able to be in this world. They were, they were, they were I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong picture. They, they, were, they, were super, they were super, super excited to be in that world. Um, and they, did, you know, you could say, well, did they use their kids so they could get what they want? You know, maybe. But I mean, we take a lot of, there's a lot of cases where kids do like, eh, people attack the Ramses for that too, Patsy Ramsey. Um, and they say, you let Jean Benet be and all these things. It was, you know, why? Well, did Patsy Ramsey get something out of it? Sure she did. She did live a little vicariously through that child. She got to go to those exciting things, you know, be part of that world. Um, my brother-in-law, Simon Brown, uh, championship boxer, um, did I get an excitement out of being his sister-in-law and being able to go to the fights and everybody's cheering? Here comes my brother-in-law. He's coming down with the entourage into the ring. Dun, 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 you know, and now he's in the ring and he's fighting. And then if he wins, you know, he wins and knocks the guy out and everybody's cheering. And then we all go out and celebrate. You don't think I got something out of that? Of course I did. It was thrilling. It was fun. It was exciting. So I liked having a boxer, famous boxer in the family. So a, fa uh, so a regular whole family suddenly gets chosen by Michael Jackson and they get to go to Neverland and they get to go on a private jet, Michael Jackson's private jet. Are they going to be suckered in? Probably, you know, they probably will. Oh, and then I want to show you something else I saw in the, in the, in, in the show. And I kept looking to see whether, is there proof that this is absolutely true? But I never saw anybody knock this down. One of the families, the one that lived in Australia said that he, uh, he called the, uh, the boy, little one, that's the, and he said this, he sent him messages, he faxed these things over to him, to read, tell little one to read my message every night before sleeping, say 30 times before sleep, I will practice because practice makes perfect. Let's make it a goal to love each other with all our hearts, a bond that could never, that could never be broken. I mean, I mean it, something, your family and mine. Make me happy, little one, and be the best. I love you. I miss my little one. I also love you. Bring your apple head back now. And then, what's this one? I can't read that one. That was in the movie that these were faxes that were sent from Michael Jackson to the child. Those are almost love letters. Now, I don't know. Are they, are they real? Really, Michael Jackson's? Well, here's the thing. When they put out the... The, the uh, documentary that said that this leaving a never, Neverland was a bunch of garbage. Why didn't they trash those letters? Why didn't they say those letters were fake? I didn't hear anything about that. So I find that interesting because I'd be, that's something I'd really want to knock down because that's creepy. Um, even if again, not sexual, even if it wasn't sexual, why is he professing his love to somebody else's child in that way? It's creepy. It's like they have this incredibly strong bond they shouldn't have because he's a kid. And you're not his parent. Why are you having a, that much of a bond with him? Not okay. So, uh, what Michael Jackson did, even if it wasn't sexual, was inappropriate, completely, 100% inappropriate. And, I, I, and anybody who can defend that, saying, oh, well, you know, just because he was naive and, and had a pure heart, garbage. He's an adult and knows dang well that he has power that kind of power and that he can manipulate people to do what he would like them to do. And he, and he did. So, um, and I'm, so the next thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to look at your, look at some of your comments first. And then I want to talk about the issue of his own children and the Martin Bashir, the Martin Bashir documentary, which led me to believe that he has a problem with the truth. And because he has a problem with the truth, uh, then we have to question, is he truthful about what is he truthful about and what isn't he truthful about? So, but before I do that, I'll check in. Hi, Annie's here. Hello, Annie. Um, let's see. Um, uh, you would think, Lisa, I'm assuming his close people advised him that what he was doing was uh, reputation and legal suicide. Yes. And that means that whatever he felt the need overrode all sense. All common sense would say, stop doing that. And if you keep doing that, 
then you have this real strong need in you. And it's concerning because there's a lot of ways to get your, need, your needs met in theory. If you want to help children, uh, you, you want to be around children, you can do this in a public way that you can, you know, have enough of that without getting creepy about it. But he didn't want to stop the, the personal relationships he had with children. And even though he should, and that's, that's concerning. Um, uh, Doreen says, it is creepy and sounds like MJ's wording to me. I've wanted to believe the best of him, but it's hard. It's a little tough, um, but I don't know. You know, it's, it could be that there was nothing sexual. It's just all, if he was very asexual, it's possible he did not have a drive to actually have sex with little boys and just wanted the, the complete friendship of a little boy. That is, it is possible. I, I can see that could be true. Now, it is fairly unusual for an adult to have no sexual desires. And if, you, if your love is toward a particular group of people, your attraction is to a group of people, usually the sexual desire comes with it. But there are certain people in the world who are asexual and, and just want to be friends, have a deep, deep friendship. I'm going to allow that to possibly exist. Um, uh, what, what does that mean? The entitlement to two two-year marriages. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Um, oh, and wait a minute. Hold on. I'm going back here a second. Um, and oh, that is that is a good point though. Carol, Carolyn says it's a narcissist. Entitlement is a narcissistic trait. That is that is correct. Um, Judge, generally speaking, that you think you have the right to do what you want to do. You're entitled to do that. And when you think you're entitled. Yeah, you oftentimes think you don't have to listen to other people's advice. Now, some people will say, well, those families of the kids, they thought they were entitled to Michael Jackson and his money and his fame. They could have been narcissists too. <laughs> you know, I don't know what kind of people they were. Uh, they could be narcissists and think they had the right to get that. Once they were offered it, they should have the right to keep it. Um, instead of being very realistic and saying, okay, you know, we have to, we have to know that he's very famous. And if we get a couple times to be around him and he's helping our career, that boy we'll just be thankful and walk away but you know they get sucked in and whether they're sucked in through narcissism or they're sucked in through the simple fact that it's a drug you know it's a massive drug and giving it up is just horrifically painful to many people i don't actually knew um could he have had the thought i am michael jackson they can't touch me or i'm michael jackson everybody loves and knows i would never hurt a child it's possible because one, you do, you can become, you can think you're untouchable at a certain point because you do have a massive, you know, people love you. And it's to uh, already, I can tell you this right now, because I'm allowing for, to, I'm trying to help people understand the possibilities here. I'm going to a lose subscribers, <laughs> B I'm going to get hate mail because I'm going to get all the people and the comments. I'm going to be, I'm going to be like checking comments out like this because I don't like, rude stuff in my comments. Uh, I don't mind your opinion, but I mind rude stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get that and I'm going to block people off the entire channel because they're going to say hor horrible things to me. Um, and it's because they want to believe 100% that Michael Jackson could never do such a thing that he is pure, pure, pure. And if he has people believing that, then he himself may think that he is untouchable. That is true. But be between his fame, his money, and as legal uh, people, he may think they can't get to me. And I, I, I can, as long as I play this game right, as long as I start it carefully and then make sure that nobody sees anything, it's just the child's word against mine. And I won't, and I'll push, they, they, they claim that he threatened the children by saying, if you ever say anything, we're both going to go to jail and we're not going to be with each other anymore. And that is a common thing that a predator will do. Um, they will do that. Um, they will say that because they want to scare the person and not talking. And of course, there's also the humiliation of, of actually going public with, with what, whatever sexual things happened. So yes, if that, if he was doing something, he could well have thought I, I can get away with this because of all these reasons. Yep. So absolutely. Um, <laughs> Joe says <laughs> just a passing thought, but why hasn't this channel got thousands more subscribers? We need more objective voices on the internet rather than the usual vacuous crap. Viva Pat. <laughs> because it's not vacuous crap. <laughs> that my channel will, like I point this out to him. folks, I'll never have a million subscribers. It's never going to happen. And I know that I, I'm very well, I want to, I, I can accept that what I want to present 
is criminal profiling information, how to analyze, how to be realistic, and on so, so on and so forth. And that's not the super popular stuff. But I'll tell you this, I've got the best people. And I would rather have a fabulous group of subscribers, a fabulous uh, patrons, a fabulous chat room here, because I want quality, not quantity. Uh, you know, and hopefully I'll have enough quantity for the channel to survive because that is an issue. But I want quality and I don't want to just throw that all away just to, just so I can have a million people because I just, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I just, you know, at this point in my life, especially, you know, <laughs> I want to do what I want to do and I want to do what I think is good and not a bunch of garbage. So, um. Yes, this is very true. Uh, celebrity and television or film fame is a power that can blind anyone. It can be hugely seductive. It is hugely seductive. It absolutely is. Um, and as I say, it's like a drug and it's something so abnormal. It's not something that most people ever, ever have a chance to participate in. Um, and so, and it's hard to give up, you know, it is. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons a lot of people were willing to do things in the news business. They're willing to just go along with the program um, and, and experts will go along with the program, whatever agenda it is, because they don't want to lose their television life. You know, not, not only just the money, but just being well-known, being somebody that's on TV. And then all of a sudden you're not somebody and you're not, you're not somebody here and you're not somebody there. And suddenly you're, ordinary <gasps> yeah. and once you didn't once persons didn't got a chance not to be ordinary they don't want to be ordinary you know that's that's kind of the way it works sometimes um let's see uh oh this is a question um was he still interested in his special friend kids when they got older the theory to that is no um that they didn't they didn't they weren't like his buddy buddies until they were teens and that or, or adults they yeah he liked that young impressionable naive age and I'm not going to say that that's not a fun age. My, my granddaughter's eight right now. She's really fun. Sometimes I prefer her over an adult. <laughs> my adults are like boring and depressing and they're like, you know, talk about their health problems. You know, I, I'd rather have her and we can do puzzles together and, and we can have fun and do all kinds of silly things. I understand liking kids. It's okay to like kids. It's okay for Michael Jackson to like kids. You just have to do it in an appropriate way that doesn't get you put in prison or get your reputation ruined. And once you did, once you made the mistake, once you should have learned, learned what was going on. All right. Now I want to talk about the, the question of, is he a truthful person? And if he isn't, why is he not? And why would he, would that mean he could be not truthful about other things as well? Now, when Martin Bashir did his documentary, there were a couple things that were very, he pushed, he pushed. And of course, they're the questions everybody has asked about him. Um, one of them is, did he lighten his skin? Um, or was this actually a disease? Uh, and, and, you know, you're getting into, how to say that properly, vitiligo? God, I can't, what is that? This, this is where editing comes in. So you don't have to screw up in front of people. Okay, vitil, 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 vitiligo. I, I don't know. I can't pronounce it. Vitiligo. Um, uh, so I can do it in sign language. White. Anyway, <laughs> vitiligo. Um, yes. Could he have vitiligo? Well, we go back to to the earlier days um, when he was part of the Jackson Five and was just beginning as a child. And what we see is. Um, Okay, you know, he's, and by the way, there's lighting here. So he's actually fairly, he's like this, about this, this is his skin color in general. Um, this is hot, this is lighting hitting his face. I, I believe he's not quite that theoretically light skin in person. Um, so anyway, um, could he have vitiligo? Maybe. They said at his death, supposedly they saw he had vitiligo. I don't know who said that. I don't know if there's proof of it. I really don't. And, and you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, now, the question would be, supposedly as, as it started to come upon him, this vitiligo, he supposedly used um, uh, brown makeup to try to blend it in. Now, the problem I have with this whole story is it's very, very 
the story is not very well explained. You know, usually when something has happened to you and it's happened to you over a number of years, you can explain it. Um, you can explain it really well. In other words, where did the vitiligo start? Well, my vitiligo first started on my, nobody saw it on my face because it wasn't there. It started when I was eight years old. It started when I was 18 years old, whatever. And it started with my hands. And so that's why I wore a glove, I know, <laughs> I wore a glove because I don't like vitiligo on my hands. And then I hired, I went to these doctors. I went to Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. And I was like, what am I gonna do? I'm a performer. You can start explaining this. And then you can say all the different things you did and you can give the, the treatments you did. Uh, you can talk about, um, and if you got to the point where you decided it was better to bleach your skin to match the vitiligo part as opposed to trying to cover it up. So in other words, you go white instead of black, essentially in your skin color, um, light instead of dark. There should be a reasonable explanation. Now, one could say it's none of our damn business. None of your damn business what he did. He has every right to have whatever skin color he wants. And if he had vitiligo, it's, you, you need to get out of his physical, you know, physical ailments. You know, he, you know, <laughs> it's not our business. That may be true. But when it becomes a major discussion to the point where people think you are a liar, because in, 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 in all truth, most people began to believe throughout, and I'm not saying the media is correct, but because they saw the shape of his nose change from a very wide nose to a, uh, a very narrow nose, in other words, a more negroid nose to a, what's called Caucasian nose. Those are, those are designations. By, um, uh, so if that's true, then was he, and the claim was he was trying to look like a white person. So he was a black guy when he was a kid, and then when he got older, he looked more and more white. His face got, face, his skin got lighter, his, his um, mouth got thinner, his nose got thinner, and his face, facial features changed. They thought there was a lot of plastic surgery going on to change his features to the fact he looked more like a white person. Those were the claims. Now, I don't know if any of those are true, but you know, if you're being dogged by those things that people think that that's what you're doing, you know, there are ways to explain things um, with, with a little bit of people around you, the medical people, to explain this so that people stop saying those things. And, and you know, that's, if you don't want them to say those things, then explain it, and they'll stop saying those things. It's never really explained. He, he, he hems and haws, and he says things to Bashir, which just, like, he's avoiding it, and just saying, oh, those tabloid people. Uh, Matt, Martin Bashir actually asked him, how many surgeries did you have? And he said, one. And then he goes, no, two on my nose. And he said, only so I could breathe better, so I could sing better. Now, first of all, you should know whether it's one or two. Secondly, there was supposedly, supposedly an accident where he fell on his face and supposedly broke his nose, and after that he had some kind of problem with the nasal passages, so he had to have surgery for that reason. I don't know if that's true. It's just a good excuse for a surgery, I think. But anyway, but how many times did you have to do that? Now, he also didn't say to Bashir, when I had that accident, it blocked my ability to breathe. He didn't say that. He said he only had the surgery to improve his singing ability. Now, that's not the same thing. So what's the story on the nose? So we're getting some questionable stories on the nose. And I'm sorry, but that, that, there was so much done to his nose that he, that does not, I don't, you know, that's not normal. Even if you've had no, no surgery, what happened to his nose is beyond bizarre. Um, and I've never seen anybody else with that condition. Um, and it almost looks like, you know, he's a, almost looks like a cadaver. That's questionable that that's what, he just had two surgeries on his nose and that was it. Uh, and then when apparently at the autopsy, they found, you know, other scars from other things that were done to his face. So I don't believe he's telling the truth about plastic surgery. Why not? Because he doesn't, because he likes to manipulate, because he feels like he can get away with whatever he says. Uh, or, you know, because otherwise he could simply say, you know, yes, I've had a lot of surgery because I never liked the way my face looked. <laughs> I always wanted a, th I just wanted a different shaped face. It just bugged me. I have, a, I have an issue with, um, you know, my, 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 my own viewpoint of my body. It's true. I've grown up with this because of my daddy. My daddy just made me feel bad in my body. So I just always wanted to fix it. It's a little problem I got. He could have said that and be, it would be over with. Okay, do it. You got a problem. Let it go. Now. That's one thing that was really weird um, was about the skin lightening and the uh, uh, and the um, and the surgery issues. 
then he comes down to the, the children. Okay, so now we get to the children. All right, so he gets married again. All right, and this is, um, what's her name? Uh, this is his second marriage. And this is, and now let me read you some of the stuff it says about the second marriage here. Again, we have issues about why they got married and what's going on. And, and Bashir had, um, oh, not Bashir, but the other one, the, the one, the anti-Bashir the Bashir one, the anti-Bashir one, had her come and defend Michael and their marriage and what happened with their kids and her claim that they are biologically his. Okay, so what happened here was that supposedly this, after he broke up with Lisa Marie, um, after starting a f blossoming friendship with nurse Debbie Rowe at the medical center where she worked, the king of pop looked to her for comfort after his breakup with Presley. And by the way, here's a person with a severe personality disorder. I'm going to say that there's some, there's the really, she creeped me out totally. She did in that, in that show. Um, I'll put the link below. Um, he and Lisa Marie had broken up and I was trying to console him because he was really upset. It wasn't long before Jackson and Rose said, I do, at the Sheraton on the Park Hotel in Sydney in 1996. The best man was an eight-year-old boy. <clears throat> okay. Um, during the wedding, Rose was heavily pregnant with her first child, Prince Michael, who she would later gift to Jackson and exclude herself from their lives. Okay. She talks about this. And, the, and the, the rebuttal to Bashir. Um, she actually says she, she didn't want the kids. She just wanted to give a gift to Michael. That He wanted to be a father, so she gifted these children. I'm sorry, children aren't gifts, lady. They're not gifts. You, you don't make children and gift them to people. That's appalling. That's absolutely appalling. <laughs> you know, you have a child because you want to raise that child because you want to love that child give it give it a home and a, a happy life that's why you have children and if you can't do that if there's uh, some problem and you can't do that because you have severe mental illness or a drug addiction or you're you know, extraordinarily poor and you're only 13 and whatever whatever and then you don't gift your child to somebody what you do is you hope that you find someone who will care for the child in a way that you cannot. That's not gifting. That's finding a child a home. You don't gift a child. And that just, that just made me want to throw up. And then she excludes herself from their lives. Um, and then, of course, she had the second one suppose, also to gift to him. And now, there's a couple more things there that just really blew me away. One was that apparently she got a whole lot of millions <clears throat> for gifting. Okay? Uh, and then she said... Um, then Michael said, and this really bothered me, because Bashir asked him a perfectly reasonable question. Don't you have an issue with the fact that the kids grew up without their mother? Because once she gifted you the kids, she just left and didn't have anything to do with them. Um, again, uh, and he says, no, that's not a problem because, you know, there's a lot of mothers who don't have, you know, have a fa the father's not in the kid's life. So why can't a father have no mother in the kid's life? I'm going to tell you why, Michael, because... You, you know, if you don't have a partner in your life, a loving partner to help you raise the kids, in most cases, most cases, you're talking about if a, a woman has a baby, she should have a loving uh, father for the kids. So the children grow up with a mother and a father. That is the healthiest thing you can do for a child. Um, now, sometimes a husband will get killed. And then, yes, the mother is then does her best to raise the children without a father. It's not an ideal situation, but you make the best of it. And sometimes the mother does a wonderful job. And the same thing can happen to a man. He has children with a, a woman, a husband and wife. A woman dies. The father does the best he can to be the father to that child. And sometimes the father and mother for that child. Um, there are times when divorce comes in. It's ugly and it's unfortunate. And the kids suffer. They suffer for not having their family together. They suffer but sometimes you can't help it. And sometimes there are partnerships that aren't male, female. Okay. There are partnerships that are female, female, male, male, but generally speaking, we're talking about partners raising children together and not somebody gifting the kids away to somebody else and then walking away. So the children can grow up saying, why did my mother leave me? Oh, because she didn't care about you. Cause that's the, that's the truth. She didn't care. She just, she just, 
I, I bought I bought you kids from her. That's all. She doesn't care about you. And she doesn't. And that that is a burden for those children. And if you don't, if, my, if Michael does not think that is a mean thing to do to his kids, then that's narcissism. That all you think about is yourself. I wanted some kids, so I bought some. And I don't care that they don't have a mother. That is mean. That is cruel. And that is very narcissistic. Now, that doesn't mean you can't raise your children well, but that's not a healthy thing. Then he had another one by yet another person. And again, there's a third child without a mother in the picture. So he's raising them with, and he's, let's face it, this dude's busy. Then we're not even talking about an at-home father. We're talking about a guy who's so busy that he has, not, he has to have other people taking care of the kids. We also have a guy who has so many emotional problems. He's not really stable to have really do the best raising kids. And his kids have struggled, you know. Um, now, there's another thing here. Uh, supposedly, he says, they, you know, he didn't send them to school. Remember, he made them wear masks in public, which, again, well, I think was abusive. I mean, again, my, my buddy, <laughs> the, my, the guy I'm a fan of, Shara Khan, didn't, he raised three children without masks in public. I mean, he had just, we worked on situations to make sure that they had the, a healthy childhood and didn't suffer too much from being recognized. Um, but putting your kids in masks in public and making them walk around, they had to feel like little freaks. And you can tell them all you want, but they got to know that they're, that's not normal. Um, and then apparently they didn't go to school. And I'm, I, I'm a homeschooling mom, so I, I, I can understand homeschooling. But apparently they were isolated. They didn't have much in the way of friends. Why not? Hey, if you, if you bring in friends for yourself, why don't you bring in some friends for your kids? Hey, how about you just have a school on your property, a private school on your property. Your kids go every day with the other children, you know, and they have a play, obviously you already got a playground, but you know, you can have a whole school area. Your children can go there like a one room schoolhouse, but maybe a few different grades. You can have wonderful teachers that can handle everything. Your children could have friends every day, go out to the playground, have sleepovers with their friends. And you can even have lots of kids in your life, Michael, but no, you didn't do that. The friends you brought in were for yourself and not for the kids. So I'm, uh, again, I see a lot of narcissism here and it's, 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 it's unfortunate and, and concerning. Now, the last thing that happened with Bashir is he asked, you know, basically about the fact that these kids look like, like very pale skinned children. Um, and very few people think that those are his biologically. Uh, and he, the funniest thing was the third child, he actually said, did you, did you want to have white children? And you know, but, you know, that you got a white woman to have these white children, even though you're, the kids don't look biracial. I have biracial kids. Believe me, these kids don't look biracial. Um, I, I'm not even sure they look like, you know, one fourth black and three quarters white. I'm not even sure they go there. The third kid could come under that. If the third, if the other woman for the third child, uh, for blanket, if she was a, if she was biracial, it's possible she could have he, blanket could be his biological kid. But he claim, but so, so then anyway, so it's, it's to me. I'm sorry. These these are not biologically his, and and there's never been any proof. There's never been a DNA test. He didn't prove to anybody that they were his kids. He he didn't think he had to. But again, there's when you have when you do something so weird. And you really saying, these are my biological kids, prove it. Otherwise, just say they're not my biological kids. You can, I'm, a, I'm an adoptive parent. There's nothing wrong with these kids not being biologically his. If he wants to have some kids, that's his business to adopt children. I don't think that's a problem. If she got, if she got pregnant with some donor, sperm donor, and then he adopted the children, she's just a surrogate for the adopted children. There's nothing, he could say that, and he didn't say that. He says they're biologically his. So then she gets on the show, the the, um, the anti-Bashir show, and she says, oh, yes, they're biologically his. I'm like, <laughs> so is she a liar too? And then, then Bashir had asked him about the third child, and he actually said the, the, third, the woman who had the th blanket was black. And Bashir went, <laughs> the look on his face like, say what? Because he was, he was wondering whether Michael had an issue about only wanting white children because clearly he started to look white, and then he, then he had all the little boys he was bringing into his life. They, they weren't little dark-skinned black kids. They were all kind of white, you know? Is he had this weird thing about that. I mean, I don't get it, you know? Because I'm, I'm from a very multiracial family, so to me it's just weird. But, you know, 
Uh, so the third kid, he's like, he wanted to prove to Bashir that, oh no, see, I'm not, I'm not being racist here. Oh no, the mother of that child is black. And then Bashir looked funny, and he's like, say what? Because <laughs> blanket doesn't, he's got, at least he's got darker hair. And um, so then he goes, well, you know, black people come in all colors, you know, basically. They're, I'm like, that's true, there are different shades. I mean, all it is is melanin in your skin. I don't know when you... I always find it kind of funny when you label people black or white. I think it's stupid anyway. You know, <laughs> it really just is just dumb to me. Uh, just I just think you should just stop calling people by colors because it, everybody has a different ver level of melanin in their skin. And so what? Um, I just think it's cultural. I think we're all tr more tribal and cultural. And then we just, you know, link color to a certain group of people like this culture. And we say, oh, I see those are black people. And that person's biracial, they call them black anyway. And then if they're three quarters white, but they're famous, then they get to be black too. So, you know, it's like, or in the old days, then you had to pass as white. You passed as white, even though you were actually three quarters white. So, you know, it's all this stuff is outrageous, but the point being that he is trying to pull the wool over on somebody's eyes. And he's trying to say his third kid is biological too, and she's a, and the mother was black. But then someplace else on the show, he says that he had a relationship with this woman. Then later on, he says he didn't have any relationship. So you see, he changes his stories all the time. And they're not even believable stories. So he can't keep his stories straight, and he changes his stories. And they, they, they seem to be around um, the color of his skin, around um, his, any kind of uh, plastic surgery, and the, the, um, the biology of his kids as far as... Uh, you know, uh, whether he's the biological father of his children. He can't tell the truth about these things. I believe that. I, don't, I do not think he ever was right. He was ever honest about those things. So then you come into this problem. If you're not honest about three very important things, how honest were you about what happened with the children that you had these relationships with? And I don't know. I don't know. As I say, there is not at this point, I can't say he's guilty of sexual uh, sexual assault of uh, these boys, or whether he just had some really bizarre, overly loving friendship. But I don't know if I can believe him either, no matter what he says, because I don't think he's a truth teller. I think he's a great entertainer, but I don't necessarily think he's very truthful about a number of things. So that's where I stand on this. I, say it's, I think it's very, very interesting, but I do think narcissism um, is, plays a great part. I th believe that he he became a very much a, a the, 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 he was the important part of the Jackson Five. He, all the attention went right on uh, Michael, Michael Jackson. And then he grew up with such fame and fortune that I think maybe he, somewhere along the way, he just uh, didn't have an opportunity to become a healthy individual psychologically. And that lasted throughout his life. And I think there's no way to say he's healthy psychologically. He wasn't um, brilliant but not necessarily healthy psychologically. Okay, so anyway, let me see what all you have to say here. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, and you know, I, <laughs> yeah, even in sign language, it's splotchy. Yes, white, splotch, yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that is true. It's painful to look at some of the pictures of uh, Michael Jackson's nose, especially at the end. He looked very, he looked so, so, horrifying and of course that led into drug abuse because he was in a lot of pain and so on and so forth so he his choices weren't his choices in his personal life weren't great um his choices for creating music were fabulous and entertaining were fabulous but in his personal life i think it was a real disaster i do i think he he was a very needy person a very desperate person i think he they he said he was desperately lonely why was he desperately lonely? Because he was unable in some way to establish healthy, consensual adult relationships and healthy relationships in other ways. That's why he was lonely. So he tried to uh, fix his problem in a way that was not healthy for the person he was using to fix it and for himself because it's just not right, you know. So. Yes, I do believe he was lonely, but it may be because his narcissism made him lonely because he was unable to actually uh, properly, uh, you know, just connect properly with people.
And sometimes that's true with genius people. I mean, sometimes when you're just that, that darn smart and that amazingly creative, sometimes it just is. Some, some parts of your brain just don't work as well. So I, I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with thinking this, this guy was one of the greatest entertainers of all time. I, I mean, there's no way around it. I mean, he's fantastic. But his, um, whatever else happened in his life, I don't think we have to necessarily think is fabulous. You know, maybe it's just sad. And I think it's, I think it's more like sad. And, uh, and I think people came in contact with him. Um, some people really, really struggled. I think his children struggled. I think the children he, I think, used struggled for whatever reasons he used them. So, um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sir, oh, okay, sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the way he had these children called surrogacy? Well, it depends. If he, it depends. If these women, if he had sex with these women, then it wouldn't be surrogacy. If, if he, if his own, if he was in a relationship and they used his, his sperm, then that's not surrogacy. But yes, if he borrowed a body of a woman to then carry a child for him, whether it be his child or not, yeah, that, that is true. Okay, so let me put it this way. If he, now suppose he's married to her, so theoretically it's not surrogacy if he's married to her and he's her husband, right? But if he only took her into his life for her to carry his children, his children, yes, that would be called the surrogate too. So, so you get, it, there's a line there. It, there's a line. The line is whether it's you have a personal, real personal relationship, and like you, you just for whatever reasons you just you know you, you got to get the sperm into the wife, and the wife, you know, then she's just implanted in her. But that's not surrogacy. But if you're hiring somebody to carry a child for you, then that's sur surrogacy. I think I'm right on that. <laughs> you can all correct me. I'm a profiler, not a one of those people um, who knows all of that. Um, this is correct. A Mask of Sanity. This is correct. The Mask of Sanity is a famous book about psychopathy. That is a, that's a very good book. Um, uh, and it was one of the earliest books about psychopathy. It really is interesting. And the cool thing about the mask concept that he, that he had is that, that in order to be able to function in life and get what you want, you put on a mask of being normal. So that you don't want people to know you're not normal because you have abnormal interests. It could be abnormal interests of serial homicide. It could be abnormal interests with children. Um, and so, so you put on the mask um, and then people, you fool people. You're just manipulating people through the fooling them with the mask you have. Now, the other thing to point out, I just want to say this. Again, um, a person who wants to use somebody often has to figure out which ones are more usable. Okay? Uh, so you know who to direct your, okay, you look at a bunch of kids and you say, okay, this one's more needy. This one seems to need a father figure. This one seems to be insecure. This one seems to want to get ahead in show business. This one has a mother who will sacrifice her kid. You find the one that is most likely to be somebody that you can manage and manipulate and, and lure into your world. And then you, then you put on whatever that mask is and you present to them safety or whatever you're trying to present. I'm just being your friend, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm, I'm as normal as the other people you know, therefore nothing bad will happen. And uh, that's, that's, you know, yeah, The Mask of Sanity is a very good book. It's uh, written by Cleckley. His name is Cleckley. One of the very first books on uh, psychopathy. Um, Joe says, a lot of dysfunctional people who are incapable of healthy adult relationships still have the desire to connect with others and feel love. They then create often bizarre fixations to compensate. That's very good, Joe. I think that is, that is correct because especially, you know, people who, yeah, if, they, if they're having trouble with the role in a normal relationship, what we call a normal relationship, let's say you're talking about a, a marital relationship, uh, where you're gonna, you have to have two people who have to get along <laughs> and you have to share your roles and whatever you decide they are, and then you have to give and take enough to be able to function. If you can't do that, uh, then you have then what do you do? You, you have something else. So some people will just become very interested in cats, <laughs> you know, you, then you, or, or dogs, you know, and 
people will call them their babies, you know. Okay, somebody's going to get mad at me saying that. that I'm not nuts. That's not why I have my babies. But, but maybe we, we, we prefer that because it's, they don't, like people say dogs will always be nice to you. Dogs don't, dogs, dogs aren't manipulative. Cats are, yes. My cat is beast that he is. He is a manipulative psychopathic cat. But dogs are just like, oh, I'm here for you. You know, so people choose different things in their life to give them some kind of a relationship and pleasure. And sometimes that can be, um, it could be, there's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, some people go into religious uh, situations where um, perhaps they want to give their lives to God and they they might uh, become a nun, for example, and then they give to the community and their community there and also into the community at large because that gives them, but they don't really want the traditional, like, the traditional traditional marriage or something. They don't want that. They want the uh, something different. So a lot of this is not unhealthy. It's just different. But the question of how much you manipulate and lure somebody in who is not necessarily seeking that same thing but you know they're vulnerable then it becomes not quite okay so <laughs> you know and th that's where the power thing comes into as well um and the where you have to where are you giving that person a real choice or are, are you manipulating them to think they're making a choice that you're making for them so that that's you know that can be problematic and you know people have um yeah, when they have trouble connecting for whatever reasons they have trouble connecting. Uh, yeah, sometimes they can, there's some interesting things that we as humans do. I mean, you know, whether it be, uh, I don't know, we get, some people become collectors, you know, massive collectors of, you know, they become hoarders. Why do they become hoarders? Because each thing that they get into their life, they feel is theirs and they can they can enjoy it and like it and, and it's not mean to them. And then you end up with a house you can, can't walk through, you know, because <laughs> you have so many friends in there. Um, you know, all, there's all kinds of things. We, we humans are very interesting creatures, and we, we, our, our, our desire to survive is sometimes um, we do whatever we feel we need to do to survive, and a lot of times we don't even understand what we're doing. So some people will say, well, maybe Michael Jackson had no clue. What he was doing was inappropriate, that what he was doing was something he needed help, you know, to make, not do. <laughs> but... You know, he had the money to, and, and, and the power to seek out help. Uh, but a lot of times people don't seek out help because they don't want to change what they are. They don't want to be, they don't want to not be able to do what they want to do. So, you know, or they just refuse to see that they have a problem at all. That's just the who I am. I'm just pure at heart and I love children. That's, that's who I am. And then they, and especially with narcissism, they'll block their true motives and they'll pretend they don't exist and sometimes they'll blame the other people for the situation that they're in you know like like for example you could say well those those parents were just trying to take advantage of me okay but were you trying to take advantage of them are you looking at that as well or not so <laughs> everyone in hollywood has plastic surgery and deny it not everyone but a whole lot of people so and I have been asked that question myself Pat have you had Botox Pat have you had plastic surgery and the answer actually is no and no and that's because well for a number of reasons one is I don't know I don't like doctors uh, I don't want to go to them I don't like hospitals I don't like needles I don't I don't like people cutting into me I don't want to be under I mean I got a million reasons um, and also sign language because I do sign language I like to be able to have expression on my face uh, so those are my major reasons but if I tell you the truth if I could do um, if I could have plastic surgery which was more like some kind of weird process where they just you know do boom and then you just look like this and you don't have to go under the knife I think I might be there <laughs> but I don't mind I would not I don't have a problem saying I would you know I wouldn't have a problem saying yeah I got work done you know you think I look like this if if I look 20 years younger right now I would have to say do you think I would look like I'm 46 when I'm 66 if I didn't have something done but, you know, I'm, I'm just one of those people. I don't care if people know the truth. But I haven't found that good, that, that, that non-invasive surgery yet. Darn it all. You know, <laughs> I would really like that. You know, somebody said that about uh, Jane Fonda recently. They're like, because I always joke that she looks better than, than I do now when she's 80, whatever. And I'm like, that sucks. And somebody said, well, but her face is not normal. You know, she doesn't look like Jane used to look. She looks like a completely different person. And I'm like, 
hell, I look like a completely different person than I used to look like 20 or 30 years ago. <laughs> you know, I look like my grandmother. I'd rather look like some other lady. I don't, I don't need to look like me. If I can look like I'm 40 years old again, I'll look like anybody else. I'm good with that. <laughs> Martin says, I want to preserve my natural beauty. <laughs> well, good for you, Martin. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Joe says, perhaps um, Michael Jackson liked young children who could be molded into roles in his fantasy, but then rejected them once they became old and began to form their own identities. They became real. Oh, Joe, you're on, a, you're on a roll today, Joe. I like that. And this is actually very true um, that there is an age which is very moldable, but then people turn into teenagers. And when they get to be teenagers, they're like, I mean, any parent can tell you, you know, oh, they were eight, nine years old. They're like, oh, you're the best. And, and you tell me what to do. And, and I want to be like you. And then they get to be 13. They're like, I don't want, I don't want to be anything like you. I, I don't want, I don't like that anymore. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And you're like, who are these children? <laughs> so yes, uh, that is also very true that he may have really enjoyed that, they, you know, he's picked, if he picked eight, nine years old, you know, actually, I suppose he's something like, more like five, six, seven. Personally, I like kind of like when the kids get to be at eight or nine, they're really fun because they're at the age where they're not, they can do stuff, you know, you can actually play a game with them and not be, it can be something better than Candyland, you know. Candyland is actually a good game. I actually like Candyland. But, you know, shoots and ladders, hate that game. And it's, it's all luck and it's boring. And, you know, I don't want to play that crap. So there's things that a younger child wants to do that is I don't want to do because it just isn't fun. But when they get to a certain age, you can have much more fun with them. You can go places with them and they, they're all excited and they're, they are fun. I get it. Why he would like that age group because they're, they're just super fun and they're not very pushy and, and they let you take the lead. And yeah, they get to be toward 12 years old and they start becoming annoying. Um, and they start wanting to make their own decisions and they start demanding more. And at that point you're like, okay, I'll find another eight year old because <laughs> you're not fun anymore. So that's true. And it isn't necessarily a, a, a sexual thing. It's just, just, just the reality of how children grow. So <laughs> um, Carolyn said, you have a very expressive face. You can almost tell what you're thinking by your facial expression. Yeah. Now, you know, I don't know this from sign language because you know, you have to do when you're doing a sign language and I did it for many, many years. Um, you have to do things on your face too to make, to get the point across and is even words that you, you have to do in the right way with your face. Um, so it, like if I said wrong, I go wrong, you're, you're wrong. So I would just go, no, that, would, that would not be, that would mean for, uh, if I could do right, right, wrong, right, wrong. So yeah, you use a lot of your face with that. And I don't know, maybe I was already that way and that's why I like sign language. Or maybe the sign language made me that way. I don't know which way it goes. <laughs> but I'm not getting plastic surgery, and I, I don't want to end up like this, and I can't move my face. So, uh, Carolyn said, is sign language hard to learn? Yes. Uh, yes. It's a visual language, which makes it really hard. It is not, it is not um, depending on what country you're in, uh, sign language is different in every country. Uh, uh, I sign American Sign Language when I was in uh, India. It's Indian Sign Language. There's Mexican Sign Language. Uh, so there's some that are close. Canada also has American Sign Language, um, but England, British Sign Language, I can't understand any of that. And so there's um, definitely different language, sign languages, and there's different accents also. Um, and also there's just a totally different grammar than than the, than our, uh, our our like English, for example, English grammar. You don't say I am going to the store. You say store me go. So <laughs> it's different you sign store first and then i'm going so it's a whole different grammar system so unless you were born to deaf parents in which case it's your first language it's not easy and you know and and, and it's easier today when i when i grew up to when i was starting into it years and years and years ago there wasn't even video we had vi we had one video you went and bought the video there was no youtube and so when you wanted to practice, you had nothing. Nowadays, you've got YouTube, so you can take lessons online and you can practice online and you can go through word lists online. And, you know, there's a lot of online stuff to help. But to become fluent, it takes, it's, a, it's not that easy. And some people just visually don't pick it up very well because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a spoken language. But it is 
a real, I love American Sign Language. I think it's a fabulous language. It's really, really, really cool language. And yeah. <laughs> well, can you do statement analysis of sign language? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great, absolutely great question, actually. Yes. Um, statement analysis, you would do the same thing. Instead of, for you who don't know what statement analysis is, that's when, let's say, you have a person and they, they, they're saying, well, what happened to your child that went missing? Let's say the Summer Wells case. The person speaks and you can do a statement analysis on their spoken language. Or you can do a statement analysis, you can have people write down what happened. And then you can do a statement analysis of the written uh, written statement. But you can also uh, do a statement analysis of, of signing the same way. Um, because you will, they will tell you the story and they will, there will be evidence of deception in that or telling the truth, certain expressions that don't match what they're saying, just just the same thing as a spoken language. So yes, you do it exactly the same way. But you'd have to be 100% fluent in the language. And culturally, just like we have the problem of knowing a baseline with somebody, what are they normally like, and then what are they like, what are they saying now? Or if a person's from a particular subculture, for example, maybe their culture expresses things differently. So in sign language, there are different uh, areas um, of, of subcultures and sign language so that somebody from Washington DC may sign differently than a person from California. So it's very interesting. Um, Pat, aside from the fact that we seem to agree that MJ's actions are creepy, what do you think? Is he guilty of what he's accused or not? Um, I know somebody's going to ask me that question. Um, The problem I have, and I'm not trying to skirt around this, uh, maybe I am trying to skirt around this, um, is that I would have to spend a great deal of time. I would have to go through the entire trial information. I would want to go through all the police statements of, of Michael Jackson. Um, I, I would have to analyze so much because I'm, What's happening is I'm getting pieces of information like like with the Leaving Neverland uh, documentary. Like the guy will say something like there was an issue about him saying they had, they had sex in a whole bunch of different places. And one of the places was in the train station that he had built there on Neverland property. And then somebody came and did some investigation and found that, that the train station wasn't even there at the time. So that's not, that's not a truthful statement. However, then the question comes down to is, why is it not truthful? Is it not truthful because he just, he didn't, he, he misremembered, you know, maybe he saw the train, maybe he at a certain age had something going on with Michael Jackson. They had sex there in different places. And then later on, he, in his own mind, af after the train station had been built, in his own mind, he recollected they went there too. And it's just, it was confusion in his mind or, or, um, or did he add that because he wanted to make it worse than it was? And, other, and I say worse with quotes on it. So let's say, let's say you only had sex in, ever, ever had some, some kind of sex in the bedroom. But then you say, oh, but we also had sex in the movie theater. We also had sex in the, in the train station. We also had sex in the attic. You know, do you, you want to make it worse? Like you having, and then, Instead of once a week, it was once every night, every time I came. You know, in other words, somebody, if somebody did it happen, but then you're blowing it up because you want to be believed, because you want to make it worse. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is you're just a lying dog. So to, for me to determine on, there's how many cases now we have here? Okay, we have the, the original case that like I got, and then we had, then these two, four, four cases, four cases. Um, so there's a whole bunch of information there, and, and I, I would have to do s incredible amounts of research to find out whether, for example, there's a similar story between the two men who are telling, they're saying now, and, and, and leaving Neverland, both of them have a very similar story about how he approached them and what he did with them. Now, is it because if they never had contact, that would be, that would be good evidence. But if one heard the other one and then just said that, that's the problem with the Me Too movement. Um, I found that that was the problem with the Bill Cosby thing, in my opinion, because one woman said he did this. And then once it was public and people heard the statement, any other woman who spent time with him would just come up with the same story. And there's no way to know that that actually happened. Now, if if 
all these women had made police reports unknowing, you know, not knowing that other women were making police reports, had never met any of the other women, had never heard anything. And you had five different police reports over a period of three years, and they all had the same story. Then you can say that's pretty good evidence. But if one woman goes to public with a lawyer and goes, this is what he did to me, then far more women pop up and say the same thing. How do we know that's true? Or they're just, you know, stealing that stuff. So to honest to God, um, the problem is I would have to do massive amount of work to become, get to the point where I could actually determine what exactly happened and who's telling the truth. Um, all I can say is his, his behaviors were very inappropriate. He should have known better, especially after the first case. That, that he went and did it again makes me wonder why he would risk everything just to spend some time with a boy. Um, usually, usually there, if, a, if a grown man spends that much time with a, with a younger boy in private, usually that means there is some sexual, some, something sexual to what is going on between them. That's usually the case. But I can't prove it, and I, I, I have to do a, I say, a tremendous amount of uh, research to come to, the con to a conclusion where I could say, absolutely, this is why, you know, I'm pretty, like, I'm 90% sure type of thing. All I can say now is that his behavior was extremely inappropriate and that something could have happened to some extent. Again, it could have been blown up. And, I, and what, a person might say, well, you, any touching would have been wrong. Well, that's true. But, I mean... There are different there are different levels of touching, um, and so they so there might have been some touching and only under a few circumstances. And then when you when you come back later on, you want to make a lot of money, you blow it up all over the place. And yet the the original thing did happen; it just wasn't to the level of what what you're saying now. So, but I really uh, to be I just can't. It's not because I'm scared of all my hate mail. <laughs> It's not going to be pleasant anyway, because I already said, you know, there's possibilities here, and I, I think he's got some real narcissism problems, and that's already going to make people very unhappy. So, uh, but it's not that. It's just because I absolutely do not have the solid evidence to say something happened, and therefore I won't say something happened when the evidence isn't there. So, thank, yeah, the, Anne says, I agree with Pat. Bad behavior is not enough evidence. Yes, yeah, not enough evidence to, well, I don't know what happened in the trial. I really don't. Um, you know, I did not see the trial. I don't know all the, I didn't see all the trial transcripts. I don't know why he was found not, not guilty. He wasn't found innocent. He was found not guilty. Um, I don't know why he paid the kid off the $26, million, the other one. I don't know why these two guys are saying what they did if nothing happened, but maybe they're just, and they, they, they say that before they said nothing happened, now they say something happened. The families are involved, but you know, there's, you have to do a lot, a lot of investigation to try to determine whether you have a whole pile of liars or whether you have people who, where something did happen, but now they're being manipulated by the producer and the media to add to the story. It gets very, very convoluted when you're talking about this level of fame and that level of money and, you know, the media in general, I don't trust them. So, <laughs> but yes, this is very true. M Michael Jackson engaged in a disturbing pattern of behavior. That's excellent, Carrie. Exactly. It, it, it regardless of what, might have happened behind those closed doors. The pattern of behavior is disturbing, especially after the first time you should have known better, and yet he didn't stop. That's concerning. Um, uh, hard to know if him repeating the behavior that caused him so much trouble was a great to the world or a compulsion that he couldn't control. Well, that, you know, there, there's that's, that's some interesting points there. So, Essentially, one way you could say that once he, these, the, the, the kid had the goal to say these things about him, and then he had to pay him off, and he's so pissed at everybody. He's like, you're telling me I can't ever have a little friend anymore just because one kid tried to take me to the cleaners? Yeah, I'm going to do what I want to do. So that's possible. Uh, as far as compulsion, you can't control. Well, compulsions, that's always, I mean, they say the same thing about serial killers. They can't control themselves. They can. They can They can choose when and where to do things. So there is a choice there. Um, but that you don't want to give up what you like is the problem. Um, and and apparently, as I pointed out, his legal team had to say, don't do that again. Never have a child alone with you again. Hey, when I was married, my husband was a soccer coach. 
<laughs> I drilled that into his head. I'm like, never go take a kid any place alone. Be sure you have another parent with you. I said that when he was a soccer coach because I'm like, you know, in this day and age, all that, you know, a kid, kid could say you touched him. And you, what are you going to do? So, you know, ruin your whole dang life. You're going to destroy your family because some kid claimed that you put your hand where you shouldn't have been. Don't be alone with a kid. So if you're going to help a kid, let's say, so there's some kids, you know, they really needed some help, you know, soccer because they just... They couldn't hit, kick the ball, you know. Don't meet them alone on a playing field. Bring other kids with you. Bring in other parents. Tell the parents, bring the kid down and I'll help. Have people there. Um, does that, Now, if the parents are in collusion with the kid, they could still say you did things. I mean, you can't stop everything, but you also don't want to keep putting yourself in a bad position. And he did that so often that you got to wonder. You do. got to wonder. Um, <laughs> well, that's a compulsion he didn't want to control. Yeah, I mean, we all have, you know, it's like, I, I really don't want to have anything to eat tonight, but dang, I'd really, you know, I don't really want to eat anything later on, but gosh darn it, I really want that. <laughs> you know? And then you say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and have it anyway, even though it's bad for me. Yeah, I think, I think there's that little bit of both. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. And what if he was just kind-hearted and because he had no love from his parents, he wanted to be kind and treat kids well because he didn't have a childhood. And that is what all the fans, super fans, say about Michael Jackson. The answer to that is no, no. Just, he, these kids had families, okay? First of all, um, he didn't want to treat all kids well. That's not the problem. As I pointed out, you, he could have done tons of things with children. More and more, and he could have done something every day of his life with children, every day that he wasn't working. He could have treated them to all kinds of cool things, been involved in any way that was public. And these children, they had families. They already had families. He didn't need to interfere with their families and become their best buddy when they had already a father and other brothers and things like that in their life. That's a, that's a narcissistic thing. So it isn't just he was kind-hearted. He chose to basically pulled these children into his life in an extreme way. You know, he had, he had a way to help a million kids, not just one. So why just one? You know, why not help a ton of kids? You, you, um, let's say, um, uh, I want to, I want to promote profiling. I want people to be able to become profilers. Let's say I happen to be fortunate enough or someday, <laughs> I get 10 million subscribers, which will never happen. 10 million subscribers, and I'm making some really big cash. I mean, you know, I'm one of those, like, super, super YouTubers, right? And now I'm making, what do, what do those guys make, some of them? Are they making, like, 10 million a month or something ridiculous, <laughs> right? Okay, let's say I just made, in one year, $10 million. Now, I've got two choices. One is I can open a really good profiling school, and I can charge, I can have a very, very uh, uh, low-cost I can also, um, I can also give away a ton of uh, uh, scholarships to people. I think they can take tests with me and interview with me, and if they pat, they can give them scholarships. I could support police departments around the country. Um, I'm even trying to do that here. I want to have more a profiling school online that's free for people because I want more people to understand it, and that's why I do these shows so you can understand more. Or I can find one 18-year-old boy. It's kind of hot, you know, and I can, I can bring him into my life and I can, I can take him out and buy him presents and I can buy him all kinds of things that will make him happy and I can teach him profiling and he can hang out with me and be a profile and I can just put all my, all of my interest into just that one kid. That's a little creepy, okay, if I'm doing that. It is. I mean, that would be creepy. <laughs> but... A lot of times what will happen is, and this, uh, this is one other thing Dr. Grant pointed out, which is absolutely correct. If he were not Michael Jackson, nobody would support what he did. If he were the regular guy down the block, they'd all say, get away from that creepy dude. You know, there's something wrong with him. He's doing things he shouldn't do. You know, he's having his kids, you know, he's you know, luring these kids away from a family and spending all this money. They're just taking him to buy candies at the store and he's giving them presents. And sh That's exactly what you call a child 
pedophile. That's what you actually look about a predator. Come and see, come and see the little puppy. You know, here's some candy. I mean, it's exactly what they do. But because of Michael Jackson, we say, oh, he's, he would, he just loves children. But we wouldn't say that about the guy down the block. We'd say that's creepy. And yes, it is true that when you're that famous, you kind of live in a different world, especially his world, and you're at a different level. There is a truth to that. But there's also a truth to you're still a human being and you still have to follow some rules of society when it comes to children. And, and to say that you can somehow skip all that and nobody's supposed to question you is just, no, no. So, yes, and it's, it's, it's a bit of, bit of grooming and luring. Grooming and luring, it's both of those things. And, but, you know, yeah, I mean, there, there's a line you don't cross. I don't care who you are. You don't cross it. Um, and when you cross it, then you say there's something, there's something not quite right. Um, so, you know, there were reasons why people were suspicious of Ma uh, Michael Jackson's behavior with children. There's a reason. Um, I'm not, I, again, I don't have the evidence to say he's guilty of actual sexual assault. Um, and, but I can say he's very guilty of inappropriate behaviors and actions with children as far as far, I absolutely believe that I just don't I think what he did was totally inappropriate bring the kind of attention that he especially when you look at those letters if those letters are true I mean he's like talks to him like they're they're his lover he does he talks to him like he's there like it's it's creepy it's just super creepy <laughs> so um yeah, and so uh, if you, if you uh, have made it through this and you're, you're a fan of Michael Jackson and you're like breathing fire at this point, <laughs> um, let me just say this. I'm sorry that, you know, that I can't come up with uh, everything. It's just uh, uh, none of it bothers me. I can't, I can't do that. I'm a criminal profiler and his behaviors do bother me. Um, you can still believe what you want to believe. Um, uh, and in the comments below, if you're going to sit there and attack me, I will block you all out of here because... You know, it's then you you have a problem because if you can't, I I, I pointed out my my I'm a fan of Shah Rukh Khan. Um, uh, I was a fan of Shah Rukh Khan the first time I saw him in a movie. I'm like, oh my god! You know, first of all, I thought he was super handsome and he's very romantic in the movies. And I had a big crush. Uh, I've never had a crush on, a, on an actor, and I have still to this day love his movies. I own them all. You know, it's the only fan, I've, only person I've ever been a fan of is that guy. Um, and uh, but. If somebody tells me they have some inappropriate behaviors and they're questioning certain things about him, hey, I'm not his family. I'm not his friend. I do not know him. I do not know. There was a, there was a question uh, that went around for quite a while that he, uh, some of you know who uh, uh, Priyanka Chopra is because she was in the, um, she's in U.S. television. Was it the FBI show she was in? Uh, anyway, Priyanka Chopra is more well known in the U.S. Um, very, very pretty woman. And, um, they did, they've done a lot of movies together, and there was a rumor that they had an affair. Um, and he's been considered, um, let me put his picture just up so you can, so you can see, remember who I'm talking about here. He was considered, um, yeah, here he is. Okay, he, he, he has a quite a love story with his wife. He's Muslim and she's Hindu, and he met her when he was quite young, and he pursued her and got to, got to marry her, and then he became a famous star, and they've been together ever since. Uh, you can see the one son, he goes to a uh, university in California, um, and then, he, you know, they've got these other two. So, he, but he's always been considered a great husband and a great family man and totally honorable. And then came the stories that maybe on the set when he was working with Priyanka Chopra, maybe something more went on that shouldn't have gone on. I don't know. I don't get mad at people because they suggest it was possible. I'm not his wife. I, I say I don't know him personally. I don't, you know, I only see him through the media and through the movies. In the movies, he's, he's an actor. That's what actors do. I see him in the movies and I think, what a great guy. <laughs> well, actually, he plays, he plays bad guys too, so then what a bad guy. But, you know, but, but, you know, I only know him through the movies and through the media. And so I don't know, I do not know this man. I don't know him. I can't say who, what he is and what he isn't. It's, it's impossible. I can say from what I've seen, these are the behaviors that I've noted, but I'm not going to get all upset if somebody thinks, well, you know, I think he, he wandered. I mean, what, I'm not going to go screaming at people. Say, oh my God, how can you say that he loves his wife? I don't know, you know? And you don't know about Michael Jackson either. Um, all you see is what 
you you've seen in the media and what he says and you know and so you don't know so don't get so upset uh, that there are issues i mean he made his choices the one thing michael jackson could have done for every one of his fans is not do what he did in other words after the first time if he was totally innocent of that first uh, accusation if he loves his fans the way you want him to love his fans and love children he should never have had lone time with kids again he shouldn't have but he made that choice and so if you're going to be mad at anybody you can be mad at michael jackson he's not around anymore but you can be mad at him not me because i you know i didn't make that choice for him so please just keep civil in the comments below i am i'm if i've disappointed you with what i've said i'm sorry um in michael jackson as i said one of the greatest of all time i don't have any problem with enjoying his music thinking he's a fantastic entertainer you know i i you know if he had something happening in his personal life that wasn't so okay you know he's dead now and uh you know it's just the way it is but he's you know he'll go down in history still as being a great entertainer um so just just you know remember that and uh you know it's yeah it's, it's the way life goes um <laughs> Um, Carrie says, as for the comparison between um, Michael Jackson and Khan holding their children, only M M uh, Michael Jackson dangled the baby. Khan did not place his child in any danger. Th that is true. I mean, um, but the question is, Michael Jackson will claim, let me put the picture back up again here. He claims, and, you know, only he really knows the, the, the strength of his arms, I guess, which you could say. Um, he claims he's got one arm under the kid, and I, I would assume that if he holds the kid, the, the problem I have with that isn't so much that he absolutely would have dropped the kid. My problem is, why the heck does he feel a need to dangle his kid over the balcony to begin with? That to me is, is bizarre and again, more of an, an attention seeking thing than a, like he, like he wanted to prove he had a baby and then he's going to, you know, I'll hang it over for you so you can see. I don't know. I don't get it. He could have put the child on his shoulder and just walked outside and gone, yeah, it's my baby. Yeah, uh, he did not do that. He didn't, uh, yeah, Shahrukh Khan did not pitch his kid over his balcony. <laughs> and that's pretty high up too. So, you know, yes, he, he, he's, as far as I can see, he's had appropriate behavior with his children. Um, this is weird. And the mask thing with the kid's weird. I'm sorry. I just, I think he does. I think a lot of things that happen with his children were just... You know, it were abnormal parenting. Now, the kids say they love their father. Well, of course they love their father. They grew up with him. And I'm sure he's got, I'm sure there's many times when he was kind to them and loving to them. And I mean, we're not all perfect parents. So I, I, so I don't think that's an issue. And I personally don't have one bit of an issue if he adopted all three kids. Why not? If he wants to adopt kids and, you know, he, then he adopts kids. I just, my, my bigger concern is that he doesn't seem to think, he thinks it doesn't matter that they don't have a mother. Like that, like, oh, they don't need one. That's the part that bothered me. Not, oh, I wish they had one. You know, it would have been nice if they'd had one. It would have been a good thing, and I couldn't arrange that, and just no way I could, I, you know, I couldn't keep a good marriage going. It wasn't for me, and I really want kids. So he could have adopted children that don't have any parents, and therefore he improved their lives because they go from zero to one. But why he had to have a baby and why he had, and if he wasn't going to biologically have them, I don't know why he couldn't have adopted some older children, you know, who needed a home. I don't quite understand his thinking, but something is a little off there, and I just think he's got some, you know, he's a genius that has some serious mental issues. Um, the what? The pla huh? If you look at the kids' feet, they do seem to be planted on the floor of the balcony. Which one? Oh, oh him? Oh, no, he, no, it, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, the balcony was high up. And I mean, as I say, I don't even think he was going to drop his kid off the balcony. I just think that it was unnecessary and kind of weird. Just, and he did it really quick, like throw him over the balcony and bring him back. And I'm like, just creepy. It was kind of creepy. I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem. I think he has. And one thing people who are narcissists have a problem doing is seeing how other people see them. They think they're, what they're doing is okay, and they can, they can do whatever they want, and it's okay. And people should see them the way they see themselves. But that is not the way people always see it. So when you take a little boy and, and, and bring him to your house and, and, and throw, give him all kinds of stuff and become his little buddy, you may see that as being his buddy, but other people see it as weird and creepy. And when you put you know, masks on your kids, people think it's creepy. And when you throw your kid 
hang a kid over a balcony. People think it's creepy. So, you, but he's thinking it's normal. He's thinking it's okay because he thinks it's okay. He thinks other people should think it's okay. That's narcissism. Where you have, she just has some awareness of how other people see you, you know, but you don't. So, um, well, that's an interesting point. Objectify children. Michael Jackson seems to objectify children. Oh, well, you know, and, and that's, yeah, um, if they, they represent something to him, and if, let's say they represented a happy time of life, which he didn't have. Let's say that that's what he rep, they represented. You know, they can represent that. It, it just does, it means that, okay, for example, I think that I liked, I remember being that, teenage girl that night like, like 17 18 19 and I remember you know you go to you go to the beach with the, you know your friend or your sis and then what you do you're wearing a bikini right and this is when your bikinis actually covered some of you but anyway so you know then you, what you do is you go oh we need to get a drink don't we and then you get up and you walk down the beach together you know past the guys you know and showing off your bodies essentially what you're doing showing off your bodies and then you get your drink and then you you know, you, you go back so they can see you twice, you know, and then you're, you're also proud of yourself because you're, you know, you're, you're young and fit and firm and all that crap. Well, I remember that, but I don't start hanging around teenage kids in order to look at their bodies and think how, you know, I want to be like enjoying that life with kids in bathing suits. I mean, you know, it's like... If you have to do that, you know, maybe you got a problem. Maybe you got a problem. Um, I thought the two adult, Florence says, I, think, I thought the, do, the two adult accusers in the latest doc were believable. Oprah also seemed to find them credible, which is saying something since they were white and Jackson is black. She is an abuse survivor. Uh, Oprah, well, first of all, I'm going to say this. Oprah falls for a lot of fa people who tell lies. Uh, she had that, that guy on there that was a fake drug addict. She had him on there. Um, she, she falls for people. She does. Um, and they, they, they came across, I, I agree with you, because when they told their story, it seemed good. It did. It seemed like it really did happen to them. They, but they're also in the industry of acting, you know, so it's hard to say. They're better, they're better than Amber Heard. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I believe them over Amber Heard. But there are some, the, the attacks back on them try to, chip away at some of the things they said is not being possible during the time frames and and so on and so forth and there's other there's other things that they said which for example um they supposedly would then ask the mother do you remember this and and you know the problem is when you're trying to remember back when you're five six seven eight nine i have like like 10 memories you know what i mean from those years i mean like 10 um i can't i'm i have a horrible memory anyway but I mean, I look back and I remember, I remember walking to school and there was a, when I was five and there was a police officer on the corner and then he would wave us across the street. That's my memory for kindergarten. All right. Now, <laughs> you know, so I don't have lots of memories. So let's say I, I was with somebody and I do have certain memories, but, and certain confused memories. Then I might say, Mom, did you did, were we here at that time, or you know, am I or am I misremembering where we were at, or what year it was? That I don't think is necessarily proving that you're lying. So this is the problem when you're seeing the different things come out. I didn't find that the people who were attacking uh, Bashir, even though I say he's not one of my favorites, even though the way they were attacking him, that didn't hold water at all. I'm sorry, that was garbage. The one that's attacking Leaving Neverland has more information that seems like there's con conflicts and the fact that they testified at the trial that he did not molest them and then changed their testimony, changed later to say he did. That's concerning because either they're lying then or they're lying now. Um, so the pro I say, but who knows what the circumstances were at the time that they said these things. Oh, he's a great guy. He never touched me. You know, is it because they wanted to stay in the industry and they thought if they spoke up against him, they'd be, in, you know, they'd be kicked out? Is it because they didn't want people to know what happened to them or were they telling the truth? I don't, I honestly don't know. So to, to go back and actually try to pick all that apart, take, I could spend a year, if I were going to write a book on this, I could spend an entire year of my life doing it. But all I can do is with the evidence that you get from the basic stuff, all I can tell you is I believe his 
behaviors were concerning. Yeah. Um, That, well, that's a good point. Anne says, research shows a correlation between narcissism and infidelity. Well, that makes total sense because when you're a narcissist, you don't, aren't that concerned about the feelings of the person you're with, right? So if you have a need, well, why should they care? <laughs> well, they're, you're not going to let them know, of course. You know, and truthfulness in the marriage doesn't really matter because what the heck, um, you know, as long as you can get what you want. So yes, I would say narcissism and infidelity definitely have a, a really nice mix. Um, Let's see what Joe says here. Carrie, good point. He seemed to view them as objects or symbols that filled a vacuum in his own psyche. It didn't seem to occur to him that they were real people who eventually become adults. Very good. That's, that's, that may well be true. Because if you are objectifying somebody, they're, they're filling a role as opposed to you like them, just them. And, you know, um, I always joke about that with, uh, uh, so I've had some offers from some men and they're like, uh, why well, I would like to marry you and I'm like why because you know I don't even know if you like me and what they're doing is objectifying me and I don't mean this in a sexual way they're objectifying me in that like let's say they're a widow you know their wife has died and they want to replace the wife um, so they want a woman in their life a, a woman a woman that will eh, have sex with them maybe uh, cook dinner maybe clean or make maybe keep them company but they're not looking for a relationship with me they're looking for a relationship with a woman and would you raise your hand if you're willing to do it <laughs> so in a sense and I'm always like well no I'm not gonna fill the role you know because no I want I, I only want to be with somebody who really wants to be with me not just somebody who you know needs somebody to fill in that spot so that's a very good point um, uh, let's see like little toys yeah, to some extent yeah I think when you don't have a real relationship with somebody they are your toys or your pawns you know you can look at it either way one is nicer than the other but essentially that's true that they their side doesn't really matter it's what you can do with them you know that, that makes it makes a difference um, and Lila says, Doreen, I think it is excellent. If I were president, I'd require a license to have kids. <laughs> they have to take a course and pass. We license engineers, massage therapists, and the right to drive. Yeah, well, I, you know, even even in the world of adoption, where you have to get proof, to get, no, you have to prove that you're the right person, they screw that up a lot, too, because it becomes a very subjective kind of you know, determination. Um, and, and sometimes it gets to the point of ridiculousness, because um, we, we had a situation where, uh, I bought two white mice for my um, my granddaughter. You know, the two little ones. They didn't have the fancier ones. I wanted ones with the big ears and stuff. So, but but the white mice are what they always feed to the um, snakes, right? But I, I just got two. Brought them home, and and they got along famously. And so we had this wonderful big mouse thing with all the tunnels, and, and my, they were so sweet, and you could pet them, and they were just lovely. And then one day, one of them escaped, and cat got it. And so we felt bad for the remaining mouse who needed a friend. So... I I went online and I saw that there was like somebody getting rid of one of the what well, they were get, they had an adoption thing for a mouse with big ears, so I I looked at their page, and for to be able to adopt a mouse, they wanted to know everything about every pet I ever had, how I housed it, what I fed it, how it died. <laughs> and I'm like, are you out of your mind? I mean, I, I've had 50 years of pets, you know. I'm like. You know, to, to, this was to adopt a mouse. <laughs> I'm like, it's a mouse. You know, so I went to another pet shop and just got another mouse. So, but I mean, you know, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, where I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where we're going to require that kind of license. But <laughs> oh my goodness, um, <laughs> oh that's true. <laughs> Doreen sang about my comment on the gentleman who want. A lady in their life they want a nurse or a purse yeah that's sometimes true but you know sometimes it just you know it isn't even that they want to be cared for like you know because they, you know, they're getting older uh, or that she has some money and makes them happy but just that they want that role to be filled and 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 it just doesn't matter who fills it as long as they can tolerate them they're like okay you know so and it, it doesn't mean it doesn't sometimes work out they, they find somebody who's willing to fill the role and they're lonely too and they move in and then they get along well and then that's all good but the funny thing is their their point is not isn't that they particularly want a relationship with that person it's they just want a relationship with 
any woman that will fill the bill. So, yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> that kind of objectifies, you know, that person and doesn't make them a real person. It's just a person that, you know, you know fits that spot. So, um, anyway, I think I'm going to stop here. Cause, so uh, we have one more day of the Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S. I'm going to take the day off tomorrow and just uh, hang out and whatever. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my bird and my goldfish ended up in my cat's mouth oh as I said <laughs> well you know the, yeah l luckily it was a fairly old mouse I didn't feel as guilty but I can't I don't know how it got out of that cage but it went under the door and and I walked out and it was like cat was like so quick so quick oh oh you're most welcome Lisa thank you very much um I said this was a tricky one to do because I and people ask me to do it. I'm like, ah, how do I do this show and not make a whole pile of enemies? So, so maybe I did make a whole pile of enemies. <laughs> I'll find out in the comments uh, when I put the show up for public. <laughs> so, anyway, again, if you are still here and you don't hate me, <laughs> subscribe to the channel, like the video, check the playlist. <laughs> and um, hopefully I won't have to do another show where I'm going to make people mad in the, in the near future. So anyway, see you next time, guys.